Welcome everyone who is watching this as a recording. We have had um, a welcome already from Ellen Wood and um, an in um, a prayer from Elder uh, Sheila. And now we're going to have a reflection from Dave Saud. Welcome, Dave. Hi, thank you. It's good to be with you. Um, I thank you for this opportunity to share in your Kairos observance, exploration, consideration, celebration of sacred water. I thank you for the opportunity to join you across the distance coming today from Calgary, Alberta, and to find a place with you on the shores where the waters meet. Be assured that there are plans being made right now to mark a similar occasion with a similar gathering in Alberta later this month. And I thank you that I have the privilege with Elder Carolyn to introduce the day and I follow her lead, setting the tone perhaps with spirit. Looking at your ambitious agenda, I anticipate that there will no doubt be shared screens, shared facts, charts, graphs, with development described and defined, and you have exceptional people to do that. I look forward to learning from them and from you all. But before this happens, may I take you outside, at least in your imagination, and may I take you back in time to when our ancestors gathered where the waters meet, and may I take you from the mind into the heart. We gather where the waters meet. It has been so since time immemorial. Where the waters meet, goods and services are exchanged. It has always been so. Some have said that as long as the goods flow, life will be full and people will be satisfied. Perhaps the waters say differently. The waters flood and subside. The waters meet and part and meet again. I wonder if it was not so much the goods as the good that beckoned the people, gathered the people, satisfied the people. The stories, the wisdom, the dancing and sharing. Goods break and wear out and get lost. The good goes on. The exchange of respect hospitality, gratitude, and aid. There are greater things than goods. There is good. Foul the good and all is fouled. The waters know this. That is why the waters continue to flow. Sit here by the waters, the waters of imagination and memory. Watch in your mind's eye the rhythm of the waves the sweep of the river. Listen. Hear with the memory of the heart, the burbling of the current, the whisper of the waves, balance, respect, reciprocity. The autumn colors remind us that the seasons are changing. It is time to sit again where the waters meet, to exchange goods, to exchange the good, balance, respect, reciprocity. In this autumn season, remember the spring rains and the summer beaches. The land is worked, the seeding is done. It is time for seed and soil and shower to work their magic. So the children splash and play where the waters whisper, rest, respect. Where the waters meet, hospitality is exchanged. The guest is received, not so much a stranger, but a relation. And faces and feet are washed and thirst, thirst was quenched. There was sharing when there was abundance. And there was gratitude at the hospitality. Respect was offered and respect was received. 
this the ebb and flow of hospitality, and there is peace where the waters meet. And if, as it sometimes happens in due season, if there is scarcity, then what is shared is an even greater gift received with even greater gratitude. There was joy in this gratitude, balance, respect, reciprocity. You could see it in the eye of the child, the grandmother, the loon, and the fish. Respect, balance. When the waters abound, respect abounds. Here is creation and recreation. The water has refreshed the land and the people. And lessons were taught about how to protect the fish and the water birds, the cattle and the riverbank, how to respect the water and the waste. But sometimes in due season, the squeal of the children playing in safety is lost to the shriek of tragedy, accident, and loss. Balance is lost. Drowning is not the time for rebuke. This is a time to lament. So the people gather where the waters meet. Tomorrow, next week, there would be time to again teach respect for the current, the boat, and the swim. Today, when the waters are dark and the currents are troubled, it is time to rescue what can be saved, to rebuild what can be replaced. That is the respect for today. Tomorrow, the waters will recede and abundance will return. Gratitude will return, though it will be different. Hospitality will be restored, but it will taste somewhat bitter. But joy, a different joy, will return and be seen again in the eyes of the children and grandmothers, the loon and the fish. Today it is respectful to mourn the great loss until tomorrow. However, when tomorrow comes and tragedy returns, when the water remains dark and currents remain troubled, when the water is polluted and access is denied, it is not just the loss of water, it is the loss of respect. Someone no longer a relation but treated as a stranger no longer has a place at the riverbank, no longer a place in the community. And there is no regard for the persons downstream in the flow of the river or the flow of time. Now the cry of loss is greater, deeper, longer, a cry of terror and of rage. And the deafness of neglect is the greatest disrespect. Greed, privilege, foul the mind, foul the blood, and foul the waters. What is ours becomes what is mine. And respect for life is denied to others in the pretense that it is mine. Gratitude dissolves into restlessness. Trusting abundance shrivels in the fear of scarcity, balance is lost, along with respect and reciprocity. There is a storm on the horizon. Today we gather at the meeting of the waters to witness the flow of seasons, the flow of rivers rising and falling, seeking balance, preserving life, we seek the flow of the water unrestrained and the unrestrained flow of gratitude and the unrestrained flow of respect.
I invite you to sit in silence for a moment and let the flow of the river wash over you. Perhaps in the reading there was a word or phrase that stays with you. Hold it. Hold it before it slips between your fingers like water. Prepare yourself now for the rest of the day that follows. When you hear words of balance, respect, and reciprocity, drink deeply and be refreshed. When you hear something that brings you gratitude, say thank you in your heart to the speaker and to the water. And when there is something that darkens the water and troubles the current, consider whether what troubles you is greed and privilege and the absence in the moment of hospitality. Thank you for your time and your attention. And may you be refreshed by this day. Shannon? Thank you, Dave. Ellen? Thank you, David. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to introduce the Interchurch Hydro just uh, Justice Group and Ellen Cook. She's also known as Dr. Ellen Cook, and she's also known as Elder uh, Ellen Cook, and she's also a sister of mine, Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the things uh, Manitoba uh, Interfaith Justice Hydro Justice Group is got a sturgeon uh, marking Manitoba program. And I got creative and mm -hmm. made some sturgeon. They look like sturgeon, don't they? Yeah. And uh, it's saved the sturgeon from Manitoba hydro dams. And uh, I invite you to take one home and to look up the website. Uh, there's more to the marking program uh, and you might want to take part in it. Um, I never know what Ellen's going to talk about. So I'm just going to leave it to Ellen and uh, Please take one of these when you go home or whenever you feel like taking one. Thank you. Ellen. <laughs> Thank you, Ellen. Well, I, um, <laughs> I read the agenda last night and I found out I was supposed to speak for 45 minutes. So I went into a panic. <laughs> but you know, I never have, I'm never short of anything to talk about. I just wanted to start with the, with the photos that the that Carrie brought along. These were done 10 years ago. We went through all the hydro packet communities and we, uh, we took pictures along the way and we interviewed elders. And every elder in those communities mentioned that they miss sturgeon because that was our staple fish. Because sturgeon is what we call uh, optimal foraging because you only need one sturgeon to feed a family and there's no bones in there, just cartilage. So children can eat it. It's a very healthy fish. And so that is what... Uh, the elders missed. And every once in a while, when we get a feed of sturgeon, we celebrate and invite friends to come over. But my community was flooded, and this is how I got involved with this work. I've been with the Interchurch Council, I believe, since 2004. But first of all, to fill in some time, <laughs> I have uh, our rapids. 
disappeared in 1968 or the 67, somewhere around there. Uh, beautiful rapids that thundered between high limestone cliffs where the cliff swallows nested. And, uh, and then when the river was dammed, the swallows disappeared with, along with the rapids. So when I, every once in a while, when they open up the spillway gates, with all the elders that remember what the rapids were, was like, they go down to the rapids bed and they listen to the rapids roaring between those limestone cliffs again. Although it's not the same as it was before, because it's all manipulated by Manitoba Hydro. So this is uh, some of my musings that I had written one, one day I had gone down there with my sisters and watch the river flow again. Absorbed in thought, I stand atop high limestone cliffs, gazing across the divide at a shoreline that mirrors the one upon which I stand, looking downward to the space beneath, dry riverbed, full of shrubs and willows struggling to grow on a bed of, lock, a bed of rock where wild rapids once danced. There you ran, eager to reach the end of your journey, having passed by mountains, prairies and forests, now morphing into something much grander as you merge with the calming depths of the vast lake and you continue on your journey. Mighty Grand Rapids, wilder than any I have seen in my lifetime, where every summer, father, expert boatsman, would load us up to take us for a summer gathering, harvesting, preparing for winter, picking berries, digging root, drying fish, Smoking moose meat, sleeping in prospector tents. Spirited Grand Rapids, so alive, full of energy, singing waters. You allowed many a child to sleep since time began. Tanigamumagakinipia, heard in the distance. Imatepetagapi, the voices of our ancestors, softly speaking and singing their song. As we left and danced over limestone rocks. Father understood you, knew your rhythm, when to slow, when to go faster, when to cross to the other side. Unikahik, so perilous, churning whirlpools and eddies, where spirits of ancestors whisper in the sound of the swirling water. Amazing Grand Rapids, so full of life since time began, thundering over the same riverbed, white waters, so wild, so loved by those who knew you. You were our, our identity. We were you and you were us. Absorbed in thought, I stand atop high limestone cliffs, gazing across the divide at a shoreline which mirrors the one upon which I stand. I call out to the cliffs, our grandfathers. Nimusumak, will you help with my sadness and share the pain as I grieve for the thundering Missipawesti? Waters which cascaded between your cliff walls since the beginning of time. This memory remains in my heart and will remain there till my spirit joins with yours at another, at another place of time. No more dancing and singing, no more leaping and jumping over limestone rocks, vanished so quiet, gone to sleep. So, my name is Ellen Cook. My name is North Wind Woman, and I am a water protector. Women are water keepers. We are obligated to protect the water. We protect life in water within us during the first nine months of our child's life. And when water breaks, a new light comes into the world. The word in our language for baby is uski awasis. Uski means new and awasis comes from the word awasis. This one has a bright light and it come, becomes a wasis from the world, wasis. And whenever I speak to teachers, I always say, it is up to us as adults and as teachers, parents, grandparents, to make that light shine brighter and brighter as the child gets older. But quite often, and after working in the North End for 25 years as a teacher, I found that the light not, didn't grow brighter and brighter among many of our children but slowly dimmed as they became older. And by the time they reached adolescence, due to their circumstances and the life that they lived, that light shone less and less. And what do we do? 
What would we do to save our children? Because it's our job as adults to do that. So when our baby comes, we don't get babies delivered. That's Amazon that delivers babies. We don't have a word for delivery in our language. We say Nwapamawasan, which means I will see my child. Nwapamawasan. When a woman is going to have her baby, we say, now she's going to see her baby. We don't say the baby's going to get delivered. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> I don't think Amazon delivers babies, does it? <laughs> so the reason why I got involved with, uh, with this hydro issue is because of my father. Because he must have been terribly saddened when he saw the thousands of hectares of forest that was flooded. And I get very emotional when I speak of my father because he never talked about it. But he must have felt a lot of sadness when he saw thousands of hectares going underwater. You see the result of that 55 years later, you see the result of that forest in that picture with my brother. I, I started working with, uh, I didn't start with ICH till 2004, but I was working with Schreier and Roblin, uh, not Roblin, Schreier and Philman were premiers. I was taking around petitions when Manitoba Hydro started talking about compensation. I wanted them to do action rather than give out money because that money is long gone now. But I wanted them to do things to preserve some of the areas that they damaged, like the marshes, the Summerberry Marsh, for example. The dike should have been built there to prevent the flooding of, the, of that marshland because the marshes act as, as uh, kidneys for our waterways, like Netley Marsh is affected by the Lake Winnipeg regulation. The Summerberry Marsh is affected by the, the Grand Rapids Hydro Station. And I also wanted them to, to uh, build dikes so that the graves wouldn't flood. But uh, as you know, years later, people, the fishermen were start finding floating coffins in the water because those, those graveyards at East Triple were flooded. So I took around a petition. I got 300,000 signatures to ask Manitoba Hydro to do action rather than give out money, but nothing came of it. In 2004, my sister and I were presenting at a forum at the University of Winnipeg. We had a PowerPoint and we showed pictures like that of what happened uh, in Grand Rapids when Manitoba Hydro did their generating station up there. And at that gathering, I met Hugo Unruh, who was then chief, chief, chief. <laughs> maybe he thought he was chief, but he was chair of the ICH at that time, but at that time it was called Interfaith Task Force on Northern Hydro Development. And I was really relieved because I didn't realize that there were people working on this issue. And I thought I was a lone voice in the wilderness. So I was happy to join. I was recruited. And I have been co-chair for about 14 years, maybe more, I know, maybe 18, I don't know. And our advocacy has kind of changed over the years. We've done different kinds of things. And uh, since its first inception in uh, 1975, was it 76, 75, I think, during the Northern Flood Agreement, when a group of, uh, of clergy um, pressured the Manitoba government to do an inquiry into this when the, when the Indigenous people up north were trying to come up with an agreement to be compensated by Manitoba Hydro. And this group of clergy gathered together, I think it was Manitoba Aboriginal Rights Co Coalition at that time, and then later became inter Interfaith uh, Task Force on Northern Hydropower, which its name changed over the years. But uh, the church is rallied behind the First Nations to force the government to, to conduct this inquiry on the Northern Flood Agreement. So our focus has changed over the years. Three years ago, we had a Kukums gathering in my community to discuss how we as, as women could help our communities um, heal, especially with the young children. 
because there had been rashes of suicide in these hydro impacted communities. And my best friend lost his son two weeks after he graduated from, from high school. He went down to the lakeshore just as a Genpeg uh, hydro station was impounding the water. That means holding back the water to, so the water would rise. And this young man who was a real avid hunter and trapper, beautiful young man, beautiful soul, who already had a father who was grieving the loss of the land because there were already uh, three or four other generating stations in their area. This young man went down to the lake, lake shore and shot himself through the heart. And he was discovered by his grandparents. So it has been devastation everywhere that hydro has been. So these kukums began a process which was then interrupted by COVID. Of course, like COVID interrupted so many things. Um, we were going to meet again the following year and then every summer after that and to see what we can do uh, and take action to help our communities heal, especially our young people. We had our plans kind of thwarted at that time because at that time, those two fugitives were being sought by the police up north at Fox Lake and Gillum. So many of the grandparents weren't allowed to travel. Grandmothers weren't allowed to come to our gathering, but we still had 15 anyway from Easterville, Nelson House, Split Lake and Grand Rapids. So there were a few of us anyway, and we had a nice gathering. Carrie was there as a grandmother. <laughs> as a recorder. <laughs> So um, now the Interchurch Council on Hydropower has joined with several other organizations to do action against hydro. I was recently uh, put on a brand new hydro accountability board and we're going to make hydro accountable for decisions that they make, especially with, with what, is going on, not, uh, what is going on now with the Public Utilities Board. So our, some of our members have been involved. I have had joined a couple of the meetings around the Public Utilities Board and the Bill 36. I don't know if you've heard of Bill 36, but it's an omnibus bill, omnibus bill that the provincial government is bringing forward and it's supposed to be in the House, I think now as we speak, but they've been holding standing committee hearings on it. And some of our members have uh, spoken, I believe at those, uh, standing committee meetings. And we are working to oppose the bill for several reasons, because Bill 36 could raise the price of hydroelectricity for Manitobans, even though Gertson says no, but I never believe politicians. <laughs> bill 36 allows current and future government, any current and future government to create new rules on how electricity rates are set without having to justify it before the legislative assembly. And Bill 36 also dis disproportionately impacts vulnerable Manitobans as it strips the Public Utilities Board of its impartial oversight role in setting hydro, hydro and natural gas rates for Manitoba. Bill 36 muzzles the, mob, the pub, the PUB, from being able to critique government's actions. And it also uh, uh, limits hearings from a live in-person setting to strictly written presentations and or is done behind closed doors. And Bill 36 also makes major changes to hydro before the results of two major reviews of its operations have been completed. It's a complicated bill and I think it's a step towards privatization and we need to stop it. The NTP have uh, have postponed it until October because it came into the house a few months ago and the NDP postponed it. So we need to take action and stop this government from muzzling the Public Utilities Board. So Ellen mentioned the Sturgeon Marking Project and this has been around for three years, I think, going on three years, an awareness campaign intended to bring attention to the impact of hydro generating stations on the on the sturgeon population. And the sturgeon population is being severely depleted, especially on the Churchill River, because the Churchill River, had, I think, is down to, is it 20% flow or 30% flow? Because they dam up the Churchill River. 
I was just up the, there last week looking at those mm -hmm. those um, um, control structures that they have because Manitoba Hydro has reconfigured probably 95% of all the rivers and lakes in our province. And they continue, they want to continue to do so. So uh, sturgeon symbol, if you see a sturgeon symbol on hydro poles, you know who the culprit is. <laughs> it's a public utilities board, so it belongs to us. The hydro poles are ours, so we can mark them up. That's our, that's our justification. And recently, the Interchurch Council on Hydropower has launched an initiative called Mama Wigo Eskitastatan. Let's work together to make it right. Inviting Manitoba churches to partner with Indigenous community groups in, in projects that seek to reverse those harms and contribute to communities. Re commu communities, resilience, livelihoods, healing and wellness, and safety for children and youth. And uh, Robert and Robert Miller and um, <laughs> yeah, Robert Miller and Amanda. Amanda. Um, and, uh, sorry, Amanda, slipped my mind. Amanda Layton are very much involved in this, and we did go up to Easterville and we met with the teachers and uh, other folks in Easterville to talk about this. They were very willing. So we asked church groups in the spirit of reconciliation to roll up their sleeves, contribute time and skills, raise funds if needed, and work with our Indigenous neighbours on projects where communities are in the driver's seat. The way our resources are being exploited is just not sustainable. It's just awful what happens in our communities. I don't know how many of you realize the damage that Manitoba Hydro has done not only to the environment, but to our psyches, our, you know, 55 years later, I still tear up when I think about what was done in my community and how it must have affected my parents, even though they never spoke of it, but it must have hurt. Because the water contains, the water is sacred. It contains the spirit of our ancestors. And we sit, when we sit by the river and we listen to water. It, it's the spirit of our ancestors talking to us. It is very sacred to us, but corporations don't know that. Corporations in their greed are constantly appropriating, abusing, destroying our waters, fracking, mining, tar sands extraction, hydro dams, taking free water and bottling it and selling it back to us. How wrong is that? You know, the water is basically free to them and they're bottling it and people still continue to buy water. It's terrible. And global warming is also drying up our lakes so we will eventually run out of water. There's already millions of people in this world that have no water to drink. And corporations are the largest water users with nearly two thirds of all water consumption going into producing ingredients for corporate supply chains. Our mother earth is not going to allow this to continue. You know, our mother is alive. She is the one that has sustained us. Everything that we eat comes from mother earth. And I often tell the students, when I talk to students, I just talked to a, a couple of, um, uh, groups of students in the last couple of weeks and I spoke at the learning lunch downtown talking with the speaking with the speaking to homeless people and office people that came to the Air Canada Park to listen and I often say you know that earth we are sacred I tell the young people you are sacred creation is sacred and you are creation, therefore you are sacred too. Everything we eat comes from the earth, so the earth is inside of us. We are earth, therefore we are sacred. And it's, you know, we, have, we need to tell our youth that so that they don't, don't waste their lives away. Mother Earth is not going to allow it to continue. She's showing us droughts, floods, just as she shows us extreme storms, wicked winds, fires, earthquakes, 
So Mother Earth has been using her four elements to try and speak to us. And who is listening? She has used Earth in the form of earthquakes and volcanoes. She has used the wind and the air in the form of those wicked storms that we have experienced, hurricanes, typhoons. She has used fire. The fires in the West, fires all over the place last summer. And she has used water and floods and drought. And it is time to listen to our mother when she speaks. It is time for everyone to listen. The sun, global warming, the heat destroying the glaciers, the polar ice cap. I remember 30 years ago, uh, an Inuit man came from Greenland and spoke to us in Grand Rapids. And he said when he was a youngster, he must have been about 70 years old at the time. He said when he was a youngster, they played on the glaciers and there wasn't any water to be seen. And he said, and then when he was a teenager, they started to see trickles from those glaciers. And by the time he was 70, the water was gushing from the glaciers. So the polar ice cap is melting. Therefore, the water, where is the water going to go? This is a crucial, crucial time, and I'm not sure whether we have the time to correct our ways in order to save ourselves. Someday the corporations, the corporation heads will find their hearts, brains, and conscience. Will there come a day? On the day that they discover this, it will be, it will be the day that Mother Earth will stop sending messages through her four elements, the earth, wind, fire, and water, to teach us one of these, teach one of these, each one of these have the ability to help or hurt. Fire can hurt, water can hurt, earth can hurt, and air can hurt. Look what happened when we all had to wear masks for two years because there was disease in the air. Mother Earth, the one we refer to as Tigawi no. That's what I call my mother, Nigawi. Tigawi no means all of our mother may take it upon herself to ease the droughts, refill the lakes that have dried up, stop the floods, the superstorms, the global warming, glaciers melting, forest fires, and then begin to heal herself because she is badly damaged and we have hurt her terribly. As a child, I was often told to be respectful to creation. If I did anything wrong, it would affect me, I was told. We have a saying, we, we did not weave the web of life. We are merely strands in it. Whatever we do to our brothers and sisters in creation, we do to ourselves. And I have a very good uh, example of that. One day, my father, when I was about seven or eight years old, I can't remember how old I was, but I was pretty small. And my, I was walking with my father and I picked up a stick and I saw a really beautiful spider web with all the angles and all the you know, logarithms, whatever you, the spider uses to make these webs. And I picked up that stick and stuck it into the center of that spider web and started twirling it around. And my father was never one to raise his voice, but he said, my daughter, why did you do that? He said, don't you know that that spider set the net just like I do so I can feed you so we can eat? He said, that's what the spider does. The spider sets that net very carefully so he can catch food to eat. And you know what the spider eats? Those bulldogs and those flies that you always complain about. <laughs> so the next time you complain, I'll tell you, well, those flies could have been caught in that spider web that you destroyed. My father was a great teacher. He taught me many things about how we respect the environment. Um, I guess that's the lesson behind that is watch your actions and your words. Oh, I was going to talk about the Shinei, very important concepts in our language. Be respectful of creation. Our original law is based on this premise that whatever you do to your brothers and sisters in creation, you are doing to yourself. And the concept of Ustinewin and Pastawin are very strong in, in our culture. Um, 
But watch your actions and your words, lest it come back to you. I'd like to tell that to the corporation, but I don't think they would believe me. Anyway, I better leave some time for Carrie. Mm -hmm. Carrie speaks fast, so. <laughs> I'll try and speak slow. <laughs> Maybe. Um, I'm not going to talk really long. Ellen was the one that we shared a lot, and I really, really appreciate Ellen and Ellen's sharing. And also, just to say that one of the ways that we work that we, I hope that we continue to work as the end of church council in hydro is to be listening to those who, um, firstly, to those who've been impacted um, in their communities. And I think that's a, a high priority. I, um, I'm i just gonna share a little bit to help clarify, hopefully a little bit about some of the advocacy work that we're doing specifically around um, the Churchill River Diversion. I'm curious, how many of you have a, a good sense of what the Churchill River Diversion is? Anyone, other than yourself, yes? Uh, sort of okay yeah you do okay excellent so a few people have a sense of what the church of average version is um so but i think it's one of those things that many of us in manitoba don't have a good sense about um so i'm just going to show a, a few a bit of a slide here so you can see the lower churchill river up by the blue arrow arrow when in 19 the 1970s when the um i'm just gonna turn this so i can see it um when Hydro de decided that they were going to develop the Churchill River diversion. They um, put in place something called the Misty Falls structure um, right there. And um, what ended up happening is the lower Churchill River became almost essentially the flow became really dried up. And that's what, uh, what Ellen was mentioning. And that's the area where a lot of the sturgeon that used to be in part of that are right now really endangered because there are parts that the flow gets completely cut off at times. Um, and so their, their spawning and their ability to, to go through up to the Nelson River is, sorry, up to the Hudson Bay is um, completely cut off at times. And other times um, when there are huge flows, when there's an excess of water, then they'll flush it out and then it'll completely flush out the Churchill River. But what happened is when they built this Missy Falls and the low, they uh, um, uh, made the lower Churchill uh, flow really slow, then um, communities like Opipano uh, Piwan, Cree Nation, or South Indian Lake um, were flooded over by the rising flood waters. And um, then they rediverted the water south through the Rat River and then into the Nelson River system. And in that Nelson River system, what they did then is they created a lot of extra flow in order for them to be building a whole series of dams. Um, the most recent one, of course, which was just finished recently. Last year was Kiaf, and Kanawapa is another proposed one. Whether it will happen, we don't know. Kind of hoping it won't. Um, but that, so that's basically what the Churchill River Diversion did. And in the process, um, when they started the original license, um, they said, we're only going to raise and lower the, the levels a little bit. But in fact, then they started doing something called the Augmented Flow Program, which meant that they the, the waters um, of South Indian Lake, that big flooded area became, started going up and down a lot and um, caused a lot of damage, um, like some of the damage that you see in these images. And this became known as the Churchill River Diversion. And right now, one of the things that we're doing with the Under Church Council and Hydro is to um, advocate, is the word I'm looking for, uh, on, on behalf of those, particularly in the North, um, particularly folks like, um, uh, I know, so you can see an example of the, the, the high rises and falls um, between low, this is, this, uh, pictures taken the same day um, out of South Indian Lake between, and you can see how much that fall is. So trying to advocate like with folks like Les Dysart from South Indian Lake to say this is um, something that isn't, uh, isn't really a helpful way of doing. Um, in fact, it's causing a lot of damage. It's causing a lot of damage to the fish. It's causing continued erosion of shorelines. It's causing um, uh, of methyl mercury continued to be in the water and was causing a lot of damage to, to the area overall. And when the South Indian Lake uh, was moved, um, Les was one of those when he was a child that when it was in 1971, was it was moved, 1971. Um, that lost his home because of that, as did many others, and as well as his father um, here, Dave. And um, 
So yeah, working on trying to raise awareness that in, in 2026, the, there will be a permanent license renewal um, for that. And Les has been working really hard to say, this is something that we need, the Hydro needs to be consulting with their communities, communities that are affected um, by this. And because they basically say it's, they can do whatever they want with this augmented flow with the water fluctuations. Um, and the license would then sort of set that permanent. And we're trying to say, you know, hydro needs to be consulting with people who are affected by that. So that's basically what I wanted to say. Um, Robert Spence is another partner from um, uh, Split Lake or Tasquiac Clean Nation. He's the, an artist who did the two paintings that are here. You can see them as well. Um, he's also a counselor and he's also been working really hard around um, uh, raising awareness around the lower surgeon, uh, sorry, the surgeon in the lower Churchill River and the, the effects on them. And um, also it happens to be from a community, Spit Lake, where they're continuing to have to um, boil water, even though they have a, um, uh, a treatment plant in their community. And this part of the re results of that continuous extra flow of water that's coming through the lower, the, the Nelson River system because of the uh, CRD. Um, so uh, I'll just end with the, this quote, let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream from Amos, um, the prophet Amos, because that's what we need is justice. Um, and this is just this, uh, an image of what we, the Surgeon Mark Martin Project, and Toby Femme wants to join. We every once in a while we have some uh, marking days. And we're also just beginning to put on some CR or QR codes, as they're called, um, beside them so that people can get to this website. There's a new website that we created as well, surgeonmarkingmanitoba.com, that talks a bit about why we're doing this and why it's important and what, what's happening with the surgeon. I'll end there because I think we're, are we out of time? How are we for time? We are doing time? Do you want to say anything else, Alan? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, questions for, if you want, I also have the song if you want to listen to it. <laughs> I just wanted to mention about the augmented flow program. If you ever hear about CRD and AFP, augmented flow was something that the hydro was given uh, by the Manitoba government parameters to which that they're supposed to stay in raising and lowering the water levels. But the augmented flow program has allowed them to deviate from those so they can raise and lower the water levels to their advantage whenever they want more water to flow through their generating stations, they can uh, lower the water levels. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Essentially, they have massively just re-engineered the whole landscape in the north. Yeah. yeah. So they've made the Churchill River flow into the Rat River, and then Rat River into the Burntwood River, and the Burntwood River into the Nelson River, so that they can maximize the potential of their hydro stations. Yeah. So this, I'll just play it while we're doing this. And this song is a song that we put together around hydro and put it together as a group sing. So here we go. I'll just play it. Sing along. Sing along. One, two, three, four. Not that long ago, some of you might even remember a hydroelectric project up north gathered a little attention.
Pleased to thank Ellen Cook for her wonderful presentation with lots of information, lots of challenges, and uh, very much a connection with Mother Earth, the sacred water, with all the creatures, with each other. And I probably missed a few things, but uh, and also to Carrie, who's our technical person, as well as an actual right. member on the Interfaith Council uh, of Hydro Justice. I'm pleased to be able to introduce uh, our next speaker, Janice Bone. I have a little write-up about her. Janice recently defended her master's thesis, Water Dreams and Treaties, uh, Agnes Ross, Stories of Treaty Number 5, and she explores hydro development and Treaty 5 negotiations. Her talk is entitled Hydro Development in the Treaty, Treaty Relations in Treaty Number Five. And she's here, and I just ask that you welcome her. And uh, where did she go? Who's <laughs> here? Good afternoon. <clears throat> My name's Janice. I have a Bachelor of Arts degree in Native Studies, Criminology and Sociology. I have a Bachelor of Nursing degree from the U of M. I also, I'm a foot care nurse. I have a Master's of Arts in Native Studies. And I have an obstetric certificate from University of British Columbia. I presented my research at Western University Linguistic Conference and my thesis was titled Water, Dreams, and Treaties, Agnes Ross's Memek West Oak Stories in Treaty Number no. 5. <clears throat> Regna Darnell from Western University and Gerald McKinley have agreed to supervise my PhD research in sociological, cultural, linguistic anthropology 
at Western University in London, Ontario. <clears throat> so my uncle, Hubert MacDonald, he's a medicine man, and he performed a ceremony for me to receive my spirit name. He told me, don't be afraid, he said. During the ceremony, my grandfather came and told me, and you're a jingle dress dancer. My grandfather told me my Indian name was Northern Lights. My clan was the wolf and the black bear was my keeper, my protector. And then I was to dance the jingle dress. When I was a child, my pukum, she told me, you're an indigenous person. You're going to learn the language. You're not speaking English in my house. She told me, Nimosum. My grandfather told me lots of legends when I was a little girl, and I can't repeat them in English. He was a good medicine man. People used to call him. And when I was a child, he would teach me medicines. She said, today I don't see medicine men like him. My mom, Pauline Ross Rots, only went to grade four, but her grandmother, Naomi, my kukum's mom, helped raise her. She said, before they used to have arranged marriages, you needed permission to take a woman from her parents. So I was, I was immersed, and she told me that Two men from Moose Lake came to ask her grandmother for her aunties. One was a Pachinos and one was uh, Umperville. And she said, that's why you see Umpervilles in Cross Lake and Pachinos in Moose Lake. That's the way it was. You had to ask permission for a woman. You couldn't just take her. So I was immersed in my language because my mom only went to grade four and she couldn't really speak. English. My, my late uncle Stanley Ross said, we had a treaty with the Inuit. He said, that's why we got dog team. Plus, we're a Mushkego, he said. That's another term we call ourselves Swampy Cree. Umushkego. They also live on the Hudson Bay. Prior to my nursing school, I worked in Chesterfield in the hospital founded by the Green Nuns, working with handicapped children. We had a similar culture. I became close friends with Judy Summer. Took her family took me hunting on the Hudson Bay and accepted me into their family. Judy's dad always said he liked her nishmonias. Mm. My aunt Christina and Kukum said to me, She said, when you leave for school, remember you're a real Anishinaabe because we raised you. You don't need to go looking for your culture or language anywhere else. Nina Kiki Pikigun, she said, I raised you. Treaty 5 is known as the Winnipeg Treaty. It was entered into in 1875 at Barrent River and Norrie House by the Queen of Great Britain and Ireland and the Soto and the Swampy Cree tribes, Omoshkegot. And as long as the river runs, Jay Maldrum said, in seeking interpretation of the Treaty 5, one does not have to go further than to the written text of the treaty to find the statement that is taken to lie at the root of Crown arrogance towards interpreting Treaty 5. In the treaty, the Indian signatures agreed to hereby cede, release, surrender, and yield up to the government of the Dominion of Canada for Her Majesty the Queen and her successors forever all their rights, titles, and privileges whatsoever to the lands in the following limits. Page 44. Through the Treaty 5, the Crown secured title to their land in the southern part of Manitoba in 1875-1876. 
and the Northern Adhesions in 1908-1910. As James Waldrum said, has described it in his book, As Long as the River Runs, Treaty 5 signed in 1875 and in its adhesions signed in 1908, 1909, 1910. The initial treaty process was related to the need to secure land for settlement as well as important transportation corridors. The adhesions were more related to natural resource use, page 39. This message of this well-known statement seemed to be clear to the Crown and Canadian common law practice, especially since Indigenous nations were not mentioned as founding members of Canada and forgotten in the Constitution of 1867. The Indigenous people became a fiduciary obligation of the Crown, Merrill Annes Phase 2009, denying the source. The crisis of First Nation water rights states, astonishing the Constitution Act of 1867 and Section 9124 sets out that the federal government has full and complete responsibilities for Indians and land reserve for Indians. This put the Indigenous nations under the power of the Crown and the assimilation policies that followed, instead of placing them as equal partners in forming Canada. This compounded the unjust and unequal relationship after the treaty negotiations. It was not until the enactment of the Constitution Act 1982 that Indigenous culture was protected in law. In that tunnel of time, 1867 to 1982, the state created policies to oppress Indigenous people. They indoctrinated settlers into the belief that Indigenous people needed to be assimilated. Indigenous culture after enactment of Constitution 1982 is now protected in law, can cause people now to ponder, what is the written text? Is the written text a reality of what took place at treaty or is it a distortion of the truth? because of the unilateral interpretation of the Crown and her laws. Should we not give the oral interpretation of the Indigenous history of the treaty-making process the same value as the written text if our cult if our cult is protected in the Constitution? Amy Craft in her book, Breathing Life into the Stone Fort Treaty, Anishinaabe Understanding of Treaty One, Amy Craft 2013 discusses why is it that the current elaboration of the foundational intention rests primarily in the Crown's understanding of treaty? Why is it that the Anishinaabe oral version of the treaty is systematically discounted and practiced by courts in the Crown? Should only one system of law that were relied on for the negotiation of the treaty form the framework of interpretation, or should Anishinaabe legal principles both procedural and substantive informed interpretation and implementation of the treaty today, page 14. Peter Kulczewski, professor of Native Studies at the University of Manitoba argues in his book, Unjust Relations. In spite of the fact that the Nishka lost the case, the Calder decision was seen by many as a major victory in the struggle for Aboriginal title. Six Supreme Court justices had agreed that Aboriginal title existed in law when it was not extinguished, continued to have force, a persuasive defense of the concept of Aboriginal title, including a powerful argument that that title could not be extinguished unless the sovereign showed a clear and plain, plain intent to do so, was recorded in Hall's dissenting opinion. These are views which were eventually adopted by the Supreme Court. In the treaty negotiations, there were three languages spoken, Soto, Cree, and English. Why is only one given precedence over the other? Harold Johnson, two families, shares the same theory of the language barrier in treaty. According to Johnson, 2007, the misunderstanding of my ancestors at treaty was linguistic and conceptual. We did not understand your language and your concepts of property. When Commissioner Alexander Morris explained the written terms of the treaty through interpreter, my ancestors likely did not understand the underlying concepts that would be familiar to your family. It is not certain that he did explain all the terms of the written text. 
His journals and letters do not indicate that he explained a meaning. Your family associates with words, seed, release, surrender, and yield up all rights, titles, and privileges. Page 41. As well, my family oral history does not coincide with seed release, all titles and privileges to the land, as it is shown in my thesis titled Water, Dreams, and Treaties, Agnes Ross's Memagwestuk Stories in Treaty Number 5. However, it does discuss stories about the land, like Neil McLeod, 2007, discusses in his book titled Cree Native Memory from Treaties of Contemporary Times. He says the connection people have to the land is housed in language through stories and words. We hold the echo of generational experience and the engagement with land and territory. Page six. <clears throat> My great great grandfather, Tapastanum, the, the one who radiates light, Donald William Sinclair Ross, was born in 1805 and passed away in 1881. He signed Treaty Number no. 5 in 1875 in Norrie House, Manitoba. My mother is Pauline Ross Rots. Her mother is Agnes Ross. Her father was Edward Thomas Ross. His dad was John A. Ross Papamutogama, walking boss. His father was the past enemy. He signed Treaty for Pamichigamak. He was called the Pagan Indian. Alexander Morris, that's Alexander Morris's account. Because when Tapastan went to negotiate, he negotiated for our language, our culture, and our traditional way of life to be protected. I was born in 1981, and Tapastam died in 1881. And this 100 years gap brings to mind Louis Riel's famous quote, my people will sleep for 100 years, but it'll be the artist to awaken my people. When I was a child, my late uncle Howard Halkrow told me I would speak for the rights of our people. When I became an academic, I did my research and my uncle Dion Pusis told me that Kukum was passing her treaty knowledge on to me. My Kukum told me her aunt, her Kisigos Saida Hamilton, was a direct witness of the signing of Treaty 5 in Norrie House in 1875 and passed her knowledge on her. Oh, mistake Yatsumuta. She told her lots of stories on the history, and she told me the treaty story in our language. That's written in my thesis, and that's published online. Treaty 5 was first signed in Mimiwi Zibing, Baron River, and the book Bounty and Benevolence, Ray Miller and Tuff. It states Chief Barons reasoned. When we made this treaty, it was given us to understand that although we sold the government these lands, yet we might still hunt in the woods as before and fish, and the fish in the water should be ours as it was in our grandfather's time. Although this statement was made some 15 years after the treaty negotiations at Barron River, it was made by a particip participant in those negotiations. And it is therefore strong evidence that assurances were made about livelihood. Page 129. Although this, this is strong evidence that water was never surrendered, the present narrative made by Willie Barnes, my common law partner, a direct descendant of Chief Jacob Barnes, at treat, said at treaty there was no land surrender made at treaty. They never sold the land to the government. The same narrative holds true for Pamichigamak as well, because the past Denim, who was famously called the Pagan Indian, went to Norrie House to secure our language, culture, and traditions. He never sold the water. The Omishkego way of life is to protect the land, the water, and animals. When I was a child, I was told you must learn the white man's ways, but we will never give up our hunting, fishing, trapping, language, or traditional way of life. I was told you have to learn your ways and never to leave home, but just to go to school. There was a misinterpretation at treaty because Manitoba Hydra was violating our way of life because we can no longer pagatoa, catch lots of fish. My Kukum said before Hydra, Niki Pagat Nigan, I could catch lots of fish just like Pagatawagan. 
that calls Bhagavagan means the fish. That was a fishing town before hydro. They're affected too. They used to have a vibrant fishing industry, hence the word Pagadawagan, which means to put your fishing rod down to catch fish. If you read as long as the river runs, Treaty 5 First Nation communities tried to stop the Genpei Dam. Nelson House, South Indian Lake, Split Lake, Nori House. My Kukum was in Cross Lake at the negotiations. And the chief said, why would we accept hydro when we already live well off the land without difficulty? Because of this dam, South Indian Lake lost their fishing industry. People used to live like upper class citizens. They had the biggest whitefish population in the world. When Manitoba did a, an environmental assessment, the report stated the dam was going to create the biggest man-made swamp in the world. Then Manitoba Hydro hired another company to do an assessment. And they said that indigenous people were in need of civilizing and modernization. Calling Gillespie a lawyer for Pemichigamak, his research shows in 1874, the people of Rossville and Norrie House near Cross Lake asked for a treaty. When the treaty party included Lieutenant Governor Alexander Morris, the translator James McKay arrived in 1875 at the Rossville mission. The people of Cross Lake came down to join the negotiations. Morris arrived at Norrie House and when he asked the band to elect a chief, as Lindsay points out, to pass Denham and the Pomichigamak people had to decide to negotiate a treaty with Morris on their own behalf. The past Denham was the leader of what Morris called the pagan Indians. Gillespie explains who the past Denham was and why his, why his presence was significant. In summer, Pomichigamak families had each their trading locations, mostly on the shores of Seep West Lake. Each had a kasem and the past Denham was such and was the most respected of them. He was the best hunter, a medicine man and a spiritual leader seen as close to the creator. For these reasons, he had temporal as well as spiritual authority. So my Pukum said, Nisikos Ida Hamilton, she witnessed the treaty. treaty, Monetonatsnikostau, <laughs> Treaty. So what happened was my aunt told my grandmother then at treaty time, there was a medicine man from Nori House and he was bad. He was trying to own that treaty. He wanted to be in charge and he knew how to kill people. And people were afraid of him because he knew medicines. But my grandpa, the pastor and Papa Mute said, we're not afraid of him. We're gonna go there ourselves and we're gonna sign a treaty. When you go there, you're gonna see people, are, they're gonna be scared of that old man. They're gonna come from all over and they're gonna give him tobacco and shake his hand and go under the Nori House Treaty. 
but us, we're gonna, I'm gonna go there, he said, and I'm gonna go and I'm gonna shake his hand, but I won't give him any tobacco and I'm gonna call him a stinky arse to make him mad. <laughs> and he said, and I'm gonna go sign my own treaty. And that's what happened. If you look at Alexander Morrison's account, he was expecting only one chief, but a second chief to pass then um, came and he signed a treaty separate from Norring House. And this story is politically significant today because all the five communities who signed the Northern Flood Agreement, Pamichigamak and Barrens River, never relinquished any of their treaty rights to the province. And if the past then and, Papa, and Papamut had never secured their own treaty separate from Nori House, the Northern Flood Agreement would be illegitimate today. But it's our modern day treaty and it was passed in the Manitoba legislature. Thank you. I'm going to call the way, so I'm going to thank you on behalf of our Kairos gathering for your words, for the teachings from your ancestors, and uh, maybe we'll see if there's questions for you. Okay, thanks. Are there questions? Yes. So in Treaty 5, what did um, your ancestors actually agree to that? Mm -hmm. Like, what was their understanding of what the, the treaty relationship was? Well, my grandmother, they just wanted to be partners. Like, the past then was already accepting the church. It was allowing them to build a church there. And they wanted to, they wanted to live off of the land. They didn't want hydro. They wanted to keep fishing, hunting, trapping, have dog team. Just they didn't want any development. So were they just giving um, settlers the right to come live in their community, but not giving them access to the, uh, like giving the government access to resources? That yeah. The correct yeah. That? Okay. Mm -hmm. That's a question about how can we 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 how can Okay, sure. And can we share a link to your thesis? Yeah, you yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I think it was shared online already. So I think Shannon, it's, it's yeah. actually going to be published on Amazon. Okay. Yeah, but it's just the publisher's just working on it right now. Okay. Yeah. I'm very interested in my book I'm writing about stereotypes about this whole. Um, Scientific racism, and this idea that we were like the Europeans who were, you know, savage and primitive, and all this kind of stuff, and that carried over into the relationship with, um, you know, indigenous peoples all over the world. So I will quote you in the book and then your thesis. So we can talk about some parts that we talked about, um, sure. you know, the, the, the attitudes that they have been. You're you're really amazing. Yeah. You're amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Further I'm comments or questions? I'm curious, question. I'm curious if you have thoughts on so hydro being um, a provincial corporate body um, and treaties being with the federal government with the crown, but you know negotiated via the federal government, like that is that tension between you know offloading like you you had mentioned at the end that like you knew you'd never sound signed anything with with the land was never given to the province like that tension between you know negotiating treaty with provincial with the federal government and obviously do you have any thoughts on that or is that does that come up at all well the original treaties why do we have to sign more treaties right. like we the original treaty you have to look at it why are we trying to make amend we that's the the treaties you have to look at. 
the original ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And the intent of it. Hmm. And the Northern Flood Agreement's a rich document, but there's no way to implement it. Mm -hmm. Like there is, but they're 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 not implementing it. Yeah, and there isn't a, a commitment on the part of the province mm -hmm. or the government to do that. You know, and the the treaty partners to the NFA they were supposed to all gather together all the treaty nations. They weren't supposed to do it individually. Because mm -hmm. we're all together in that treaty. We have to look at the original treaties. Mm -hmm. We have the Northern Flood Agreement uh, managed by Yeah. And is it translated into the languages of the people? No. And like I said in the presentation, that Amy Kraft makes the point that there was two treaty partners. Why is and now that our our culture is protected in the Constitution, we should be founding members of Canada. We should have our our legal Indigenous ways put side by side with the Crown, because we're both sovereign nations. Yeah. So where did you come from? Okay. Cross Lake. Yeah, yeah. I'm from Treaty by mm -hmm. And Baron River signed the first treaty too. So they have a say, they're affected by hydro because they're a holding bed for Lake Winnipeg's a holding bed. And they have problems with with flooding and fluctuations. And I'm a nurse in the community, and I talk to people, and they tell me that there's hardly any more fish. The fish look sick. Mm -hmm. Like there's issues with their fishing industry. So can I ask, what is the relationship with Kaya and the right now? Mm -hmm. Well. We, the Northern Flood Agreement, they're not even implementing it. They said they were supposed to eliminate mass poverty. And in our community, we have a section in Sagadawa called the Bronx. Like people are living in poverty. We have a Bronx too. <laughs> <laughs> um. And the water, like people don't even want to swim in the water. Like if kids swim in the water and they have like a bug bite, they develop impetigo. That's a bacterial infection. And then, you know, it's not good to give so much antibiotics all the time because it affects kidney function. And in Barron River presently, there's a water boil advisory, even in our community. Well, my Kukum used to feel sorry for us when we were kids. She said, she says, I feel sorry for you guys because of the water you have to swim in. It's brown. Before, my mom said I could see right to the bottom. It was clear blue. I could swim across and I'd see everything. And even you'll see debris, like the wood in the water. like, And then sometimes the water fluctuates and... and uh, it uh, it affects people with their boats, and my cousin Ambrose, he was a hunter, and he always told my brother to be careful with hydro because um, they open up the dams in the winter, and then it causes the ice to break. And my tragically, he passed away. He was on his four wheeler, and they flooded, and he went through the ice. So it's affecting, like, it's, we're just, they treat us like we're disposable, but we're not. I lost so, a 33 year old brother like that to the Grand Rapids. He went to the ice in the city, but he didn't know the ice. So, 
So it's the same story everywhere, right? The apartment at the bottom, the same story in all the communities. Mm -hmm. So, so, yeah. so, so what do you think um, the solution is, or what is some, what might be some solutions? Because, you know, like I just got an email from uh, David Suzuki, and he's like, get rid of uh, fossil fuels, we need to use, uh, you know, hydroelectric uh, energy, or, you know, let's go for electricity, and yet we're affecting the communities in the north. Um, do you see any short-term or long-term solutions for stuff that's happening in the community because of Hydro? Well, I think that the, um, Like right now, like as a short term, I think they should actually, because I also have a certificate from pre h 2 where I studied water quality on reserves. And they said that they're, one of the PhD students said that the way that they deal with water on reserves is um, they would never meet the provincial standards like they give them cisterns and those cisterns are plastic and in the winter time they crash and then bacteria gets in there. And as a nurse working in a First Nation community, like in the city, it's different. There's not many exposures to bacteria, but on the reserves, like kids take a bath and your skin's like a sponge. And if you got bacteria in there, he gets, you can get sick. So there's more infections with kids, like because that's like strep throat and because the water's bad. And like the short term is that they should bring our water standards up to the Canadian provincial standards. They can start by doing that. Like we create, Manitoba Hydro is a billion dollar industry. And they should be compensating us. Uh, yeah, it just you know, spends on that. I, I would think that it would be uh, Hydro's responsibility to make sure there's clean water because they want to cut out possibly pollution in the water loss. Right? Yeah, like we don't, our lagoon system is not even up to standards mm -hmm. and it goes into the lake. Like they need, we need a proper lagoon and we need proper water. Like they, they don't have the money to pay to keep a waterworks because it's expensive, but Mantua Hydro makes billions of dollars. And it sells lots of things. Lots of electricity. And yeah, and Manitoba Hydro, they give their, their employees nice housing. And they give they they build them so that they don't use a lot of energy. But like we could two meters system, right? And I know in Grand Rapids there's two meters in the houses, so they only pay for the electricity, and then uh, heat is uh, subsidized by hydro. <laughs> I don't know if it's like that in other places, but for the employees, for the employees, yeah. And Barron's River, an elder told me when Manitoba Hydro went there, they said, you'll only have to pay for a light bulb. That's it. Yeah. And we have the highest hydroelectric bills. Like if you live in a house, you pay over 600 a month, every month. A lot of people just say it's better for me just to go on welfare and let hydro pay it. And is that connected to the quality of housing that's provided? That yeah. The heating costs are higher and then there's no assistance with that. Mm -hmm. And how about some long-term uh, solutions? Well, we need universities. Yeah. We need universities in our communities. We need high schools. Like Barron River doesn't even have a high school and you know, kids have to leave home and that's not safe. Yeah, it's, it's really a shame that, you know, this uh, land that is indigenous, um, that, that we have settled on and that we make treaties with the indigenous people for 
um, very much physical, but uh, really in the treatise with that they, um, you know, there the are resources and you're benefiting and they're not, right? Yeah. Yeah. But the other unfortunate thing is if you read The Other Is Me by um, The Other Is Me, she's a professor at U of M, and she talks about the colonial relationship and how uh, LaRock, yes, La Emma, Emma LaRock, yeah. so she talks about how how colonization works is the victors, they write the history. So what they did is like Ryers to Megerson Young, he came and he studied my grandpa and my family and he wrote, but what they do is they denigrate our culture and our people and they write that in there like they're filthy wigwams. They created stereotypes about us. Yeah. Okay. Her people are kind-hearted. Like uh, Loretta de Kuhn, her parents were non-Indigenous, but she grew up in our community and spoke our language. And same with the Malots, and they speak our language. And he, one of them married my cousin. And uh, like people need to be re-educated about who our people are. We have to tell who we are, tell our story. Like if you read the Micmac and Court Act, the Catholic Church had the same teachings as our culture. Like in the Bible, it talks about the Virgin Mary. And my Kukum told me, my grandfather, he told me as a child that to keep your virginity, you'll be strong, powerful. That's why they only had arranged marriages. And that's why it's important for our kids to stay with their grandparents and their parents because they protect them. When kids come out to school here, they're not protected. And there's stereotypes about our women that aren't true. Yeah. And that's how my grandmother raised me. Mm. Like we're, we're not what they say we are. Yeah. yeah, like if you go into, well, that's why I survived it. Chesterfield in that because the way I was raised by my Pukum, I went there to work. I didn't go there to, you know, sleep with men. You know, that's we have standards. We're respectful people. If you look at Egerton Ryerson Young, he talks about the diplomacy and the respect in the communities. Well, thank you so much. I'll give you that. Um, we're going to have fun. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'd like to welcome you to the annual general meeting of Northwest Ontario and Manitoba Kairos. Um, want to um, just open by saying that. Uh, like all other organizations, we, we have been deeply affected by the COVID-19 outbreak. And so it's taken us a while to move into Zoom meetings. Uh, we sort of lost a year. The second year of COVID, we did get into Zoom. And uh, over the last year, we did have a webinar uh, that was uh, from Brandon, Manitoba. And it was, the theme was Indigenous Connection to Land. And it was just before um, the Kamloops um, discovery of the unmarked graves work. And we had an elder from Dakota First Nation, and she talked about the uh, idea of uh, unmarked graves at the uh, Brandon Residential School site. And if you've been reading in the paper, you know that uh, um, uh, there was a calf site and owner who some of those graves were believed to be part of that campground. And after some negotiations, the campground owner and uh, First Nations were able to come to agreement to mark those unmarked graves. And so it's been allowed that uh, penetrating radar can be used to 
seek out uh, the locations of children who died. We also had a second webinar and uh, it was held by Kairos West and it was uh, Sacred Water and a very good program. Um, so uh, Kairos is, in this region is always doing some educational or some information. And so if you go to Kairos Canada website, uh, you'll see what each uh, regional group is doing. And there are regional groups right across all of Canada. So those are just a little highlights of the um, of the last year. Um, Ellen Bross is our longtime treasurer, and uh, she is not able to be here. Um, I want to thank Ellen. She is the outgoing treasurer, and uh, she and I were trying to get together to find a financial statement for August 31st, 2021 to September 1st, 2022. Last night, she dropped it off quite late and she put it in my partner's car. I happened to take my car and the financial statement went with him who was going to another meeting. And so I've just finished talking to Ellen and uh, I'm just going to read the financial statement. It's not a long financial statement. So our annual uh, statement is from August 31st, 2021 to September 1st, 2022. So our opening bank balance as of August 31st, 2021 was $204.64. We uh, received income from a uh, September blanket exercise of $380. We received our national grant from Kairos Canada of $1,000. Um, from Lakeshore uh, School Division, we received a check and some other donations of $587. And that was for uh, a blanket exercise as well. And uh, in July, we made a deposit of $640 for the book sales of uh, Bob Haverluck's um, Court Case of the Creatures. And uh, so the closing balance for the income was $2,607.50. Our expenses, November 21st, 2021, was 200 and that was for a blanket exercise uh, probably to pay the elder or uh, I think to pay the elder and uh, another deposit was made of $527.50 and that also was from a blanket exercise and so the total expenses for the annual report is $727.50 so taking all those numbers into account, our closing balance is $2,084.64. And we have a savings account, which is very large, $172.94. It's important to have a savings account because we get at least an, a penny. Uh, I don't know why they don't round it up to five cents, but anyway, so I... I would move the financial uh, report. Is there a seconder? I'll second those. Mary will second that. All any questions about the financial report? Uh, if you would like a written copy of this financial report, you can email me uh, or Debbie, um, and uh, we'll send you a written copy of the financial report. So all those in favor of the financial report? Any opposed? That's carried. So you... <laughs> got, some good, got some thumbs up, that's good. <laughs> so um, as you can tell, we continue to do the Kairos blanket exercise and uh, Karen uh, Crow is the coordinator that walk, uh, works on our behalf. She's also the past chair of our regional committee. 
And uh, Sheila works with a number of uh, people who help her. And uh, uh, Carolyn Moore is the elder, usually at those blanket exercises. So we have done many, many blanket exercises in the province and uh, have gone outside of Winnipeg. Gary also does blanket exercises and moves around the province as well. So people are still requesting the blanket exercise and we're just really delighted that we have people who are committed. Debbie also does blanket exercises uh, in and around Brandon. Um, so universities, um, organizations, um, schools, uh, church groups, uh, individual community groups have asked for the blanket exercise. And it's usually the first introduction to, uh, to Indigenous history and, and colonial history and how the two of them have interacted with each other. It's a very powerful uh, two to three hour presentation. And uh, if you haven't already been part of a blanket exercise, I really could encourage you to be part of one. And you can be part of a blanket exercise many times because you'll learn many different things. It's a very good exercise. It's also a very good way to introduce reconciliation, uh, colonialism, privilege, uh, what's happening uh, within First Nations, uh, particularly in Manitoba, but it, it also extends across Canada. So uh, I have nominations and Karen is not able to, normally she would do this and she's not able to be here because she happens to be in Ireland. I don't know why she selected Ireland to be away at this time since we're so important. So I have nominations and according to nominations, I open the floor for nominations um, and I'm asking for different people to nominate either themselves or somebody else they think might be open to being uh, part of the COCO executive and also the coordinating committee. So um, I will ask three times for nominations and then I will, if there are no further nominations from the floor, I will close the nominations. So I'm stepping back from uh, being the chair of the regional group. Uh, I've had a really great time with this regional group and uh, I have learned so much. Um, and I, I'm very thankful to be part of it. And I will continue to be part of Kairos. I'm just not going to be in a leadership role, uh, which is a break for me. Um, I asked if you just give a little bit description of what a committee does. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> 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 so, great. <laughs> so, our coordinating committee is, we actually have about 20 people on our coordinating committee, and uh, people. Uh, uh, we ask, we seek people from different denominations. Uh, Kairos has 10 denominations that make up Kairos uh, at the national level. So we try to mirror that. But uh, as things go, as you know, we don't always have reps from each denomination. We don't ask the no denomination to uh, um, nominate somebody to our regional group. Um, we, we seek individuals and approach them individually. So what we do as a coordinating committee is uh, uh, Kairos Canada has a number of campaigns that they're doing. And so the coordinating committee looks those over uh, once or twice a year, and we decide which campaigns we're going to take part in. Uh, for example, one just after the TRC was released, we took uh, part in uh, a petition to ask that uh, a section of the Education Act be changed, and we collected over 2,000 signatures. We presented that to the Minister of Education, and uh, we did a lot of education with people why this was important. And I think it was uh, um, called it Action 68.1. So we spent a lot of time on that. Um, 
we have moved into doing education around the doctrine of discovery, um, uh, stolen lands, um, hydro justice, um, many, many interest groups. And each person that's on the committee uh, has an interest that they want, are pushing or would like to see us move in. And, uh, and, and so it makes it really a good committee. So if you really want to be with a group of people that um, talk very openly, very honestly about issues, uh, I really encourage you to consider being part of the coordinating committee. Uh, up to the, during the pandemic, we met uh, uh, through Zoom. We're hoping to meet in person. We usually meet in uh, Winnipeg. So if you live outside of Winnipeg, we also do a, a hookup with uh, Zoom um, so that everybody can be part of the discussion. And uh, so that's briefly uh, what we're about. Uh, we usually every year uh, decide that we're going to do two campaigns, uh, fall, fall gathering and a spring gathering in which we invite people to come in and and learn and participate, network, all that kind of stuff. So as I say, because of COVID-19, we have been challenged just like many other organizations to get back into the swing of things, but it's slowly coming along. And uh, we've learned that we can reach out through Zoom and invite lots of people from different areas. So we have people from uh, Thunder Bay, Kenora, Brandon, um, is there any other places? Winnipeg? Stonewall. <laughs> Ellen, where she is? Neverville. Neverville. Yeah. And it's also important for sharing what with the other churches, what our churches are doing. Our church yes. And so that we can um, invite, you know, more people to events and get more people to know. Yeah. Good point. Mary's just saying that we also bring in our social justice from uh, our own denominations and uh, what we might be involved uh, within our own church. Uh, we bring that discussion into the mix as well. So it's a sharing. We try to get uh, community groups uh, to pick up um, uh, actions, campaigns that Kairos and, and ourselves are working on, but we also pick up campaigns that other groups are bringing to us, uh, that they want us to partner with them. And uh, Hydro Justice is one of those groups. Uh, there, we do a lot of work with newcomers and uh, welcoming newcomers. Um, CFS. Uh, we've done work with the Ch Child and Family Services, school boards, I'm just trying to remember here. So you can see there's a, quite an exchange of ideas and partnerships that we really try to work at. Enough said. Okay, so I'm going to open nominations. And uh, since I'm stepping back as the uh, chair, um, and Karen has asked uh, these people if they would let their names stand. So for chairperson, Debbie Dandy has uh, offered herself to be chair of the coordinating committee. Do I have any other uh, nominations? <laughs> Don't all jump up here. <laughs> other uh, nominations? The third call, are there other nominations? So I would declare that nominations for the chair are closed and we welcome Debbie. Um, Carrie has been our vice uh, chair for some time now. <laughs> He's been, also been a member of, of the coordinating committee for a long time. And um, he has agreed to let his name stand for the vice chair position. Oh. And he also, if need be, will take the minutes. It's kind of onerous to take minutes, but it is helpful for the coordinating committee to know what they talked about last month. We usually meet once a month for two hours. 
So, you're okay with me now? Yeah, although, are we calling it the secretary or are we calling it the vice chair? What are we calling it? <laughs> what am I? What am I? I don't know. The what? Vice president. Vice chair with added on responsibilities. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> As and I can assigned. delegate. I'm yeah. delegating. <laughs> delegating responsibilities. Something vice president. But, no, don't say that. Uh, one thing I should say is Kerry uh, works a lot with his uh, Mennonite Church uh, Canada, and uh, and and so he's not able to move from the vice chair position to the chair position. But he will, you know, if the chair is uh, absent or not available, Kerry will step into that role. Of course, we call on him to do a whole bunch of stuff for us. <laughs> so I'm going to open nominations. First call, any other nominations for the vice chair? Second call, any nominations for the vice chair? Last call, any nominations for the vice chair position? Have I got somebody that's... Is there anyone... Anyway, I'll close the nominations for the vice chair. So we have elected uh, Carrie R.V. Stainer for our vice chair position. Thank you, Carrie. Um, for our treasurer position, as Ellen Gross has, uh, um, um, is our outgoing treasurer. Uh, we need to appoint a new treasurer. Uh, this is usually a one-year position, and it can be renewed for a number of years. <laughs> so I have, uh, Karen has talked to Anne-Marie McIntosh, who is over here, and uh, she has offered her name to stand as the treasurer. And uh, I make the first call for nominations open to the floor. Second call for nominations for the treasurer position. Third call for nominations for the treasurer's position. I'll declare that those nominations are closed and Anne-Louis McIntosh will be on program. Um, I might just call for a nomination for um, sec for secretary position. Um, we don't have one, and uh, it's not an onerous task. Um, Carrie and I and Debbie and other people have taken notes. As I say, these notes are helpful from month to month because they remind us what we talked about the month before and what we want to continue to talk about in the months ahead. Um, and it does require um, attending a regional meeting once a month for two hours, usually on a Saturday morning, um, and uh, can join in through Zoom. Um, so are there any nom nominations for the secretary position? Everybody looks away. <laughs> would like would somebody like to volunteer for the secretary position? Oh, I was really bad. <laughs> Matt is that's not job moving. <laughs> I'm an auto learner, so maybe he knows. Ellen, Carrie and I talk about uh, trying and rotating no okay. Uh we'll see how that works. Yeah. Okay, I will call nominations closed then. We're going to rotate. So I do want to thank uh, Karen Crow for uh, approaching people. Uh, past chair is responsible for nominations, and uh, she does a really good job on that and uh, is always looking for new people to join the group or to be. Um, an advisor to our group. Um, Ellen Cook is one of those advisors. She's also a very active member of uh, the coordinating committee. 
as is uh, Yvonne Baerbold from Kenora. She is one of our uh, uh, consultants and also an active member of the coordinating committee. Um, I also want to thank uh, Ellen Gross uh, for the work that she has done as the past treasurer. She's done a good job. And uh, she and I live in the same community, so it's been handy to uh, get uh, reports from Ellen. And uh, so now you'll know there's three Ellens on the coordinating committee. So uh, Ellen Cook keeps us up to date with Cree words, <laughs> which she's still trying to teach me. <laughs> and I'd also like to thank the members of the regional coordinating committee, as well as the group, uh, Kairos, uh, committees. There's uh, Northeast Justice and Peace. There's Winnipeg South Kairos Group, uh, Winnipeg West Kairos Group. There's a, a connection in Thunder Bay and also Kenora and also with Brandon. Um, there are some other connections too uh, they, and they come and go as they need to. Debbie, did you have a question? I, I was just going to say uh, I would volunteer to write a thank you no, that would be great. Yeah, thank you. And also want to just close by saying thank you to Shannon Newfelt. She is from Kairos, Canada. She is networking coordinator, and she's been very helpful to us and uh, patient with us. She encourages us and gives us lots of guidance and suggestions. And uh, we always appreciate Shannon's uh, uh, a contribution to to our regional group as well as to Kairos in general in this region. So thank you, Shannon. Here she is. <laughs> oh, I would say. Mm -hmm. Sure. So I'm Mary Nemat, if anyone doesn't know me, and um, I keep an email list to which I send um, notices about uh, reconciliation and Indigenous events happening in the community. So if you would like to receive um, emails uh, about that, then just come give me your name and I will add you to my list. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. We often refer to Mary as our communications network person, and uh, and and she is she does a, an amazing job reaching out to so many people and talking about a variety of events that are happening across the province as well as in Winnipeg. So keep up the good work, Mary. So I would uh, declare that this annual meeting uh, adjourned. Do I have somebody who will? Motion that. I okay. Actually, you can just adjourn the meeting. We don't need a a motion and a second. Okay, I second that. Yeah. Let me say, come on. I want to adjourn. There you go. Good job. <laughs> okay, we're going to move into our uh, uh, speaker for the afternoon. I would like to introduce Natalie Pops, JD. Now, I'm not sure, is JD part of your name? Jersey. No, JD is the, the most nominal. Dr. Law, Jersey. What does it say about Jersey? You can tell I'm not, you can tell I'm not a uh, lawyer. <laughs> I don't go to court very often either. <laughs> um, and she's going to talk about uh, water power, the legal world between Indigenous water stewardship and hydroelectric development. And uh, Natalie, I hope you will give a little bit of background information. Okay. So please welcome uh, Natalie uh, to our meeting. Yes, yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, we're just going to get my presentation on the screen before we get started. Okay. Theoretically, you want to use that? You're welcome. 
and just on the side of it. Yep, there you go. Okay. Okay, can everyone hear me on this? I'm gonna take that as a yes. It's not a huge room. So um well, thank you so much for having me today. This is uh, a really exciting topic that uh, I love to talk about and love to share my knowledge on. Um, I'm going to be talking for about an hour today and then saving the last 15, 20 minutes or so for questions. But uh, if anything that I'm talking about, when you get the urge to ask a question, please just do so. Uh, I'm not intending for this to be too formal. Uh, and that goes as well for the folks that are hello online. Um, uh, please feel free as well to engage with me as the presentation gets going. That worked? Okay, sweet. Um, so a little bit about myself, uh, generally and professionally. Uh, my name is Natalie Copps. Uh, I'm a lawyer here in Winnipeg. Uh, I work primarily for the Public Interest Law Center, which is uh, a branch of Legal Aid Manitoba. Um, the Public Interest Law Center does work uh, primarily in um, well, really law that includes the public interest. So we do work uh, in environmental law, in constitutional law, human rights law, some consumer protection work, uh, and as well, uh, legal work that involves Indigenous communities uh, asserting rights as well. So uh, in my practice in general, I focus um, on uh, environmental and Indigenous and Aboriginal law. So I'm using both Aboriginal and Indigenous law as two separate and very distinct uh, types of law and lawmaking. So I'll be getting into that a little bit later, but I want you to kind of stay tuned uh, and be aware to the differences in that terminology. Uh, now, before we get too involved, uh, I'm hoping I'm not going to get too legalese. And at if any point, uh, I'm confusing or talking a little bit too much as though you all uh, have legal training, please stop and ask uh, clarification questions. I'm happy to answer those. But to begin, uh, really the best way to engage with the topic of, um, of water power, of Indigenous water stewardship, of water law in general, is to give you some fundamentals of Aboriginal law and treaty making. You know, of course, we heard um, some really moving words today um, and some story from uh, Janice. And uh, you have been, of course, aware of uh, the fact that we're a treaty on territory and we have a variety of number of treaties uh, in Manitoba. So I'll be speaking a little bit about treaties in general. Uh, and then I'm going to move on to this idea of Crown authority and the duty to consult. So. But pretty simply, it's how can the Crown or the government, both the federal and the provincial government, uh, profit and exploit water? From that, uh, and within that, I'm going to be talking a little bit about how the licensing re regime works, because it's pretty atrocious and pretty outdated. And I think that a lot of folks, including myself, up to about a few years ago, weren't aware of the extent of that. Um, moving on from that, we're going to kind of flip over to the other side of the legal coin. So we'll be talking about uh, Indigenous water law, and water, uh, Indigenous water laws kind of generally, uh, and I also use the word law um, to mean something a little bit different. So it, it is a very distinct and different legal order and legal structure, so we'll be getting into that as well. And then we'll finish with um, hopefully something a little uplifting and a little hopeful. Um, I know these talks can be um, very hard to get through, so I like to end on a more positive note. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about the legal rights for nature and bodies of water. So we're covering a lot today, uh, and I hope that it's interesting and you guys have questions and you can engage with the material. So before we get to that, um, I wanted to share a little bit about my family. So uh, my family is Métis, uh, particularly on my mother's side. Um, and this is a photo of my great-grandfather, Ahmed Lajmetziad, and so our family name is uh, Lajmetziad. And we come from Red River initially, but over the years moved to and settled more in and around Manitoba in that Treaty 5 area. 
And I wanted to share this photo because this is um, my great grandfather on his, one of the last trips he took to our track run that ended up being flooded by the to the hydro. So I raised this um, because this wasn't intentional that we were gonna have speakers today that have been impacted by hydro development and, and uh, particularly in Treaty 5 uh, territory. Uh, but I, I wanted to, to raise this and, and to bring it to your folks' attention because um, these kind of developments have been impacting Indigenous people in so many different ways for so many different years. Uh, and I also wanted to dedicate my talk to my great grandfather. And hopefully, the work that I do is making him proud. So, this one is for uh, and It's also a pretty cool picture that I'm showing. Okay. So, I promised we would talk a little bit about the basics. Uh, we have a few kind of key terms that I'll be referencing throughout the talk. So, we have this idea of Aboriginal and Indigenous law. I'll be talking generally about treaty rights and title. Uh, I'll talk about the Constitution Act and Section 35, this idea of uh, crown extinguishment, uh, and then um, as well, uh, inherent sovereignty and inherent jurisdiction. Now, each and every one of these topics, you could probably take a whole master's course one, um, but put pretty simply, Aboriginal law is the colonial interpretation of Aboriginal rights and title. So essentially, it's when, for example, a First Nations group goes to the colonial courts to assert certain rights, let's say um, they say that they have a right to hunt or to fish in a certain area, and the court interprets those rights uh, within the Western legal framework, that's Aboriginal law. So for the most part, um, that's what lawyers practice in. So if they're going to court, it's Aboriginal law. Um, and then there's the, um, really for back, lack of a better word, Indigenous law. So it's laws and legal orders and traditions that come from particular nations. Uh, there is no such thing as pan-Indigenous law, so it's not as though Anishinaabe water law and Dene water law are the same, they have different principles rooted in their language, rooted in their territory, rooted in their land. Um, and those laws aren't, uh, they don't come from a Western tradition, they come from that particular nation's tradition. And I hope to give you some uh, examples of that. Of course, uh, because the examples that I'm going to be giving aren't from my uh, community, uh, and of course not an expert, and I don't speak those languages. So I hope to point you towards uh, scholars and others who do have that expertise if you want to learn more about the response. So that's generally the two differences. So for the most part, the beginning of my presentation, we'll be talking about aboriginal law. Now, treaty, we know about treaties. We've been talking about those today. Uh, in particular, I'm gonna be discussing number of treaties. So those are the Western treaties. Um, we are on treaty one. Manitoba has a variety of treaties, one, two, three, four, five, six, and 10. Uh, we'll also be discussing Aboriginal rights. So that's when uh, a First Nation person or Indigenous person is exercising a particular right. So that's when we talk about um, the right to hunt, the right to harvest, the right to trap. There's a variety of rights that come not only from treaty, but from this idea of inherent jurisdiction and inherent sovereignty um, that I'll explain shortly. And then there's uh, Aboriginal title, which is uh, control uh, of uh, land and resources. So those are some of the main topics and main ideas. Uh, now, since 1982, we've had the Constitution. Some of you may be familiar with Section 35. And that section uh, defines um, Aboriginal and treaty rights within the Constitution. and uh, intends to protect them. Now, I say intends uh, because like a variety of charter rights as well, the government is able to infringe Aboriginal rights, provided that they can justify it. And they justify it in uh, various ways, uh, including saying, well, we can't consult with them, so you know, any infringement we have is justified. 
But all that law is found within section 35. So if uh, an indigenous person is going to court, generally they'll be invoking section 35 rights. Now I've been using the term the crown fairly often uh, so far, and the crown is of course uh, both the federal and the provincial governments. It's also Manitoba Hydro because Manitoba Hydro is a crown corporation and they are what's known as an agent of the crown. So anything that they do is done as if the crown was doing it. And that raises some really interesting questions um, because they should be held accountable uh, to or for the harms that they cause, um, just as much as the government should be held accountable. So that's something that's also quite important that I think a lot of folks kind of, it makes sense when you tell them, but they might not know that kind of right off the top. Now, I want to get into this idea of inherent jurisdiction and inherent sovereignty. So what does that mean? Um, what it means fundamentally is Indigenous people prior to colonization had and continue to have um, rights and title to land, to waters, and many of them argue that. Um, and these rights can only be extinguished or removed by the Crown through a few number of ways. So until the Crown does that, each and every one of these rights and these titles continue to exist. Um, there is uh, a lot of good research on the inheritance to self-government. So um, that Indigenous people are inherently sovereign and can govern themselves uh, how they have always governed themselves. So this idea that um, inherent jurisdiction and inherent sovereignty continues to exist even when we've signed a treaty. So these are all really big, kind of complicated concepts that I hoped I uh, made a little bit clearer. But I want to talk to you today a little bit about the doctrine of discovery. I know it's kind of been in the news lately. Um, frankly, it's a legal fallacy. Uh, it comes from uh, papal bulls issued uh, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, uh, essentially allowing European monarchs um, the legal authority to uh, colonize um, and to uh, promote Catholicism at that point um, and for the Christianity across um, colonized areas. And within the doctrine of discovery is this idea of terra nullius, or that the land is empty unless there's uh, Christian people on it, which we of course know is not true. And this is something the Supreme Court has recognized. So I have a few uh, little quotes from a very important Aboriginal title case that came out about eight years ago called uh, Chicoten, where allegedly, according to the Supreme Court under this doctrine, the Crown holds radical and underlying title to all lands. So basically they show that the Royal Proclamation is issued and boom, they got title, which doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, and the Supreme Court has acknowledged that, but it hasn't gone far enough to say it doesn't apply anymore. Because if they were to go that far, then that would put into question all crown legitimacy. So they, they're prepared to kind of dip their toe in the water and say, it doesn't really make a lot of sense, but uh, not to deeply engage on a doctrinal level with that. So um, what we talk about in law is this idea that um, the crown title is what exists when the Aboriginal title is subtracted from it. So Aboriginal rights, Indigenous rights are always at play when the crown is doing anything. And if the crown wants to do so uh, in a justifiable and legal way, um, those rights need to be engaged. So the doctrine of discovery, very tenuous. Uh, I think many legal scholars would argue that it doesn't really have strong legs to stand on, um, but it's what the court continues to uphold. It'll probably have to be something from the government uh, to really get the Supreme Court to move on that. Um, but they can recognize it doesn't make a lot of sense but don't really want to do much about it. So this is a, a real tension in Aboriginal law. 
um, where we can all kind of recognize that there's something fishy, there's something rotten at the core of it, but we haven't gotten to that core quite yet. So on the flip side of that is what I've mentioned already before, uh, inherent sovereignty, rights, and title of Indigenous peoples. So Indigenous people have held rights and title before colonization, and many of these rights and claims to title continue to exist. And they continue to exist at law and are effective at law up until the Crown, uh, quote unquote, extinguishes these rights. And so how does the Crown extinguish rights? Well, the most common form is by agreement, uh, by treaty. Um, and that's where the parties come together and agree to share the land and resources in particular ways, describing particular rights um, and particular responsibilities. Um, before the Constitution Act in 1982, uh, the Crown was also able to extinguish rights unilaterally provided they did so on a very clear legal footing. So they could um, issue uh, a piece of legislation specifically saying that these rights were extinguished. Now, I take issue with that. I think a lot of people would take issue with that if you're saying, oh, we can extinguish them by agreement, but we can also kind of do it ourselves whenever we want. Again, there's something here that isn't quite fitting uh, on uh, a legal level. But I think I'm, I'm raising these concepts because eventually I'm going to get to how the crown and how the government is able to control and profit off water the way that it does on a legal foundation. So if we remember that, you know, it's really kind of shaky at its core, rotten at its core, I think it, it, it speaks to how and why hydro development continues to be so terrible for Indigenous people, particularly modern First Nations. But this idea of treaty, I know that uh, Janice gave uh, quite a lot um, of really beautiful and valuable information um, this morning on Treaty 5. Um, but treaties generally contain uh, a variety of important topics. So first and foremost, they're a, a sacred uh, relationship between the Crown, the First Nation signatories, and creator, and, and creator itself. It contains written promises, but it also contains those important oral and contextual promises. And that's why it's so, it's so important to hear from um, knowledge keepers, uh, from elders, and from individuals like Janice who are doing the work of uh, showing and telling the story that comes with treaty making beyond the written text. And this is something that the Supreme Court recognizes as well when they engage with treaty interpretation that anything written in the treaty is really only a small part of the story. Treaties also outline the mutual promises between the parties, including the rights, responsibilities, and the respect between those nations. Uh, many treaties in Manitoba, actually all of them in Manitoba, to a certain degree contain various clauses that invoke the surrender of land or extinguishment of title. Uh, now, some uh, communities that I've uh, worked with, um, you know, contest that idea that they ever surrendered land um, because they there was no land to own. You have a relationship to the land. Uh, you don't possess it in the way that we understand possession. Um, now, that really hasn't been flushed out in the courts in a legal way, but I think um, that speaks uh, to the importance of uh, when we talk about treaty, that there's so much more to it than what's written down on the page. Now, here we're going to get into the water part. So none of the treaties in Manitoba specifically reference rights over water to control water um, and to benefit from it. They often contain, uh, particularly the later ones, contain references to other types of resources, like forestry, like trapping, uh, like mining, but none of them contain any kind of water power clause. Um, and, and I think that's really important to remember and to pay attention to, um, because if the treaty defines what the Crown can do and, and what kind of relationship they have with First Nations people, um, water is missing. 
and water is not there. And so what does that mean? That means that uh, Indigenous people still hold, um, for lack of a better word, title to water. Now, I think, again, a lot of people would push back and say, well, no one owns the water, but they there's a, a responsibility and a relationship to the water that hasn't been extinguished by treaty. So how can the Crown regulate and profit off of water? Well, in Manitoba and in the Prairie Provinces, we have something called the Natural Resources Transfer Act or the Transfer Agreement. Um, it applies in Manitoba and Saskatchewan and Alberta. It was drafted and signed in the late 1920s, early 1930s that essentially transferred pardon me, um, the control of natural resources from the federal government to the provinces. And initially, water was not included in, the, in that agreement, and it was eventually included later, about a decade later, um, as an amendment. So before that, the federal government was simply just profiting off, prof, profiting off of hydro expansion and hydro development in the province without any kind of agreements or consultations conducted with uh, Indigenous communities whatsoever or Indigenous nations. So again, the legal basis for this transfer um, there is no explicit extinguishment of Indigenous rights or responsibilities to water. So how can the Crown justify its ownership, control, and exploitation? Um, and I would put to you, it can't. Um, and it continues to do so unilaterally. Uh, we also heard from Janice about the Northern Flood Agreement for Northern First Nations uh, in Manitoba. Um, and that, uh, for many people, is also a constitutional document. And while it may have um, limited the scope of rights to water in the North, it also came with really important responsibilities that haven't been upheld by government. Now, in legislation, we have uh, a very extremely outdated act that allows for the licensing of hydro projects. It's called the Water Power Act, hence the name of today's talk. Um, and it was drafted right around the time when the Natural Resources Transfer Act came into being. So we're talking about almost 100 years ago. Um, and it really hasn't been updated since or at all. Now, its um, current Manitoba Hydro water projects um, undergo much more scrutiny than previous ones did. So we have um, some environmental assessments that have to be done, consultation that has to be done. But for the vast majority of hydroelectric dams in the province, none of this was ever done. So the Water Power Act doesn't contain um, any requirements for environmental assessments. It certainly didn't contain any requirements for consultation or compensation from hydro projects. Uh, for example, the hydro projects along the Winnipeg River, the Seven Sisters Dam area, those would have been licensed simply under the Water Power Act. Uh, the Lake Winnipeg regulation, which uh, is uh, I believe more in you know, the northern area of Lake Winnipeg. Um, that came into being in the 1970s, uh, also strictly under the Water Power Act, um, and operated on an interim license for almost 40 years. So we'll get into licensing in a little bit. It's a little bit uh, niche, probably a little bit boring for some of you folks, but uh, effectively, uh, the Water Power Act really doesn't have any kind of proper oversight that we need when we're having these big projects that change the land and the water in such fundamental ways. So we've talked a little bit about consultation. Um, now, the duty to consult uh, comes up at a variety of stages now. Uh, but again, previously, really up until the past 20 years or so, uh, consultation wasn't necessary, wasn't really seen as all that legally necessary. So it was more of a point in than a requirement. 
but currently the duty to consult uh, is really triggered whenever the Crown decides to uh, regulate or take up lands uh, related to uh, Indigenous rights and title. So that can happen really kind of at a variety of stages. It can be something as simple as you know, building a dock um, where the First Nations next door need to be consulted on it. So that would require usually what the court says is a lower level of consultation, so meetings, things like that. And then we have on the other side, uh, when pipelines are being built uh, through First Nations territories, through Indigenous land, uh, that requires a high degree of consultation. But consultation doesn't guarantee an outcome. So uh, a First Nations group could be consulted and they could be heard, uh, and then none of their recommendations uh, be adopted. Uh, and that would, the courts often satisfy that duty. So it's not necessarily uh, ideal. So when we say consultation, it's an extremely important part and it can be very effective, but it can also be simply a way for the government to continue to justify its infringing conduct, which it does. So um, getting back to the uh, specific projects in Manitoba, I like to call them legacy projects. So these are the hydrodams that have been developed prior to any requirements for oversight or consultation. Um, and they often operate with those interim or short-term licenses. So basically what happened is they would get their license to start construction under this interim license, and then the plant would be operational. And then they would operate on that first initial license for decades. And then only when that license was about to expire, the Crown would say, oh, I guess we got to do something about this. And then they would issue a final license. And that's when there's more scrutiny done to the project. But then at that point, it's already been going on for decades. So nothing's really going to change. And the harms that those dams caused have already been happening for decades and decades. And even once that final license is issued, then it can be renewed for another 50 years. So we don't really have um, any legal mechanisms currently that can help us um, when it comes to those legacy projects. Now, we're working on some where there's talk of redoing the end. Um, and um, on current projects, you know, there's, they're not great, but they at least have some level of engagement with the community. We can talk about that kind of on another day, but um, most of the projects that have had very significant impacts never even hit that. So that's important, I think, to bear in mind because it really shows just how unjustified um, and how unthoughtful so much of the hydro development in Manitoba has been and really explains the consequences that Indigenous people and First Nations people in particular are facing um, still to this day, like what we heard from Janice. So I know it's been a lot of legal talk and a lot of um, pretty tough um, topics, um, but I want to take us to some alternatives because I think the alternatives are really how we chart a path forward. Um, while we can seek to make some changes on statute level, changing legislation, change the way we regulate, we know that fundamentally there's some there's some sickness at the middle of, of what the government is doing. And so I would suggest we need to look for, for different um, ways to engage uh, with water, to understand our responsibilities to water, um, and I'm going to present just a couple alternatives for you today. So there's um, a burgeoning field of law uh, called water law. Now, I want to talk about when we say Indigenous law, um, and I was speaking with um, Janice and Joyce about this at lunch. What, this idea of Indigenous law, it's not something that you can, that's a 
perfect analogy to Western or colonial laws. Indigenous law, um, it doesn't exist, as I mentioned, across all First Nations and Indigenous communities. It comes from those communities themselves. It comes from the land, it comes from the language. And if you don't have a place in that community, you really can't understand the extent of those laws. And so when I'm going to be talking a little bit about Anishinaabe water law, I want you folks to know that I'm not an expert on it. And I hope that I do some of the work justice, but I would direct you towards the Anishinaabe scholars and elders that are doing that work if you want to learn a little bit more. I'm raising it as an example because I think it's uh, really valuable. It helps us change the way uh, that we think about the in general. Um, but I'm, I'm no expert in it and I can't be. So I'm going to be talking about two different kinds of Indigenous water law. Um, so the first is uh, called the Water Teachings Project. Now, this is out of, I believe, the University of British Columbia, and it has a really fabulous website. I would urge you all to go to it. It's waterteachings.com. Uh, it's uh, a project uh, that's actually across Canada, where a variety of Indigenous legal scholars work with elders, community storytellers, to tease out some key water teachings. And um, I'll go to those now. From the Water Teachings Project and through the story, through language, through the experiences of people in those different communities, uh, the project has what is that, nine teachings that it speaks to. Uh, I was hoping to be able to show you some videos from the Water Teachings Project uh, today, but I know I'm younger and I couldn't figure out how to embed a video into my presentation. Um, there you go. Uh, so I would encourage you folks to watch those videos and, and read the stories that are um, on that website um, because they really show the depth and extent of water law in different First Nations communities. Now, the second uh, type of water law teachings are um, some that come from this territory. Uh, the Anishinaabe water principles, uh, the Nibi in Akunikewa. And I'm sorry if there's Anishinaabe speakers with us, and I hope that uh, I have done that justice. Um, but the uh, water law principles uh, come from work done by uh, Professor M.A. Kraft. I know that you know, Janice mentioned M.A. Kraft this morning. Um, she's an amazing scholar. I would recommend you all to take a look at. Uh, both her publications uh, and the um, important research that she's doing, particularly on water law itself. Um, and I'd like to read from one of her articles um, where she is citing Elder Mary Delivery about what Anishinaabe water law means. So she writes, in other systems of law, water is treated as a subject or an object often to be owned or used. In Nibi Inga Konegaven, so that's water law, water is treated as an actor in a relationship. It does not starkly distinguish between land and water. The two are connected. Their jurisdictions are complementary, mixed, and overlapping. For example, we are taught through our creation stories that the land is our mother and the rivers are the veins of our mother. All of this belongs to and composes a spirited being that we personify as the original mother in accordance with our creation stories. Our relationship with her is the foundation of our relationship with all creation. Bodies of water or waterways are also independent entities with spirits who look after them and who are acknowledged and named in ceremonies and prayer. So I think that passage really shows how deep and how complex Anishinaabe water law can be and is. In that article as well, um, Aime uh, has listed a, ver a variety of water law principles. So we say water has a spirit, we do not own water, 
Water is life. Water can heal. We must respect the water and its spirit. Water can suffer and water needs a voice. And so we, if we're looking at these two different types of teachings, you can see there's a lot of overlap. You can see that there's some distinctive and different, pardon me, laws that guide how we interact with water. And I would say, you know, indigenous water laws can help us inform, again, how we act uh, and, and how we have, and, you know, how we continue our responsibilities to water. Um, and it also helps change the way that we think about water. Uh, we shouldn't think about it as, again, a particular resource that we use to be exploited. Um, it is so much more important and so much more complicated than that. So that's just a, a very kind of brief overview of some different ways that we can start thinking about water differently. Um, and then if any of you want any more resources on this type of law, I'd be happy to provide them. I would also direct you towards uh, Professor Aaron Mills. He's at the University of McGill, and he does um, a lot of really interesting work, not just on water law, but on Anishinaabe constitutions and law in general. And he's a fabulous writer, so even if you're just interested, his work is, is excellent. Okay. And lastly, uh, another alternative that we have is this idea of legal rights for nature. So often these go uh, hand in hand with uh, Indigenous communities, but in particular, it's this idea that um, part of nature, or in this case, a body of water, um, should have the same kind of legal rights um, and legal standing as other legal entities. So for example, corporations can go to court and sue, uh, estates can go to court and sue, um, but why can't bodies of water and why can't uh, parts of nature that are being impacted by development and by colonialism go and sue over their rights? So it's uh, a new and it's a burgeoning area of law. A lot of it so far has been done through agreement. So for example, even though this is happening globally, I'll just give a Canadian example. In Quebec, uh, in last February, so February 2021, uh, the Inuit community in northern Quebec and then the local municipality uh, signed an agreement and um, issued joint resolutions protecting and giving legal rights to the Magpai River. And many of those rights, there's nine in total, some of them included the right to sue or to a court, the right to have legal guardians, but also the right to flow, the right to biodiversity, and, and a variety of other rights intended to protect the health, spirit, and well-being of the river. So that's at its very early stages. Um, it hasn't gone to court yet. Uh, it, likely in the next few years, we're going to see more and more of this, and it'll be tested by courts. Um, but a lot of these agreements are happening across the world. Now, New Zealand, for example, is a leader in this area of law, and often it's between the government and the Maori, and you'll see rivers and mountains that have been protected uh, and have been given these legal rights. Often what will happen is um, particular elders will be given uh, the role of a legal guardian over the, the particular body of water in, the mountain in this case, and then that would allow them to go to court on behalf of um, the mountain of the river. Another interesting case that's ongoing actually right now uh, is just south of us in northern Minnesota, the White Earth Band of Ojibwe has issued um, a declaration on the rights of wild rights for many women, uh, and they've been trying to assert those legal rights outside of their tribal territory. Now, they haven't had much success yet, uh, but there's some really interesting and really creative uh, lawmaking that's going on around protecting these important uh, parts of nature and parts of the world. So with that, that's kind of it for me. Um, I know I talked about a lot, a lot of complicated different topics. So if any of you have any questions at all, um, yes, sir. 
Um, okay, so you were talking about uh, the difference in my own time mm -hmm. and you said that the indigenous perspective, um, nature doesn't belong to us, we're part of nature. So within the indigenous perspective, what is land title? What does that mean to an indigenous person to have land title? Well, I think you'd need to first specify like what community, what nation, yeah. um, what it means to them. And that's done through, you know, stories, through teachings, and through ceremony. So I don't have that knowledge and I can't necessarily share that with you. Um, but um, from my understandings and my work, uh, I know that, you know, we talked about those water teachings, that there's a responsibility to water and it's a being and it's not something that can be owned. I think uh, that is something that, you know, would apply similarly to, to the land, that there's that responsibility there, that we live and thrive because of the land and the land lives with us because of us. Okay, so it would be the relationship and the responsibility as opposed to ownership, right? Yeah, and again, like, yes, and, and I think, again, like, I don't want to paint that brush that every indigenous yeah. community thinks that yeah. particular way, but I think kind of broadly, it's it's often the case yeah. that it comes down to responsibility rather than ownership, right? So if you don't own it, you can't transfer it. And that just wouldn't really come to mind so I'm treating it again. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Um, I was interested in that uh, description you had of uh, <clears throat> consultation taking place between communities and hydro, mm -hmm. but then no recommendations through the consultation being taken up. Mm -hmm. Who gets that final say in? Like, why isn't there some other mechanism for it? Right, so mitigating the power structure, the power. Right, so technically there is. Uh, in Manitoba, it'll go through the Clean Environment Commission, usually. And so in on a federal level, it would go through the National Energy Board, the National Energy Board, now the Canadian Energy Regulator. So these are administrative boards and tribunals that hear evidence from a variety of um uh, different actors and different people of interest, and then they'll issue their report and recommendations. And often it's the case, it's really a rubber stamp for that development with particular caveats attached to it. And then if a party is unsatisfied by them and by the extent of consultation, they can seek a judicial review so they can go to court. But they're all time consuming and expensive. And exactly. And the thing too, it's um, a judicial review doesn't give you money. It doesn't stop the project. Really what it does is the court says, okay, if the consultation was insufficient, go back and do it. So then you're just back to doing the consultation. And in some cases that can be effective. They might be fighting over one narrow issue, but it's, again, it doesn't guarantee any kind of uh, outcome. It guarantees the process. So it's, um, it really depends kind of on who's at the negotiating table and how seriously they take that duty. We're, we're not so litigious in Canada, right? So Less so. I think we're, I would argue, more litigious when it comes to Aboriginal law than in the States. Um, but we are, litigation doesn't result in the same kind of monetary settlements often that you get. In, in the States, yeah. I, I was um, really impressed by the youth and I think it was the Northwestern US who sued their local governments for the purity of the air. Mm -hmm. So like you are responsible for allowing us to live. And so I love the notion of giving uh, recognition to nature as, you know, as an entity that can do that for itself. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of, people would agree um, and it just kind of makes intuitive sense that there's this whole voice and perspective that's really the one most impacted by these decisions and it's not at the table. Um, it's interesting you brought that up. There's a similar case going on that was just heard in Ontario um, by a group of uh, young people who are arguing that Ontario's uh, climate targets, they reduced them 
um, and that that reduction is um, infringes their charter rights because it means that they are going to be put in a much worse position um, and that their security of the person, their liberty is at stake. And so it's a really interesting case that's going on right now. It'll probably go all the way up um, and it will be interesting in the next few months to see what the Ontario, Ontario Superior Court has to say about that. But yeah, so it's it's all kind of starting now. It's been in the past few years that people are using legal tools like this. I think they win the pension soon. I know, right? That's not a bad idea. <laughs> Well, I think that's something that hopefully some people are going to say. Yes, you have a question? Or um, another question. Uh, we're in the high level accountability board. We're trying to find a uh, uh, lake or river that we can start working on for legal personhood. Legal personhood. Um, so whatever they do, they put it there will be. But uh, what I was going to ask, does Phil have any idea how much um, Madison Ohio pays the federal government, keeping out of one pocket, put into the other, mm -hmm. in terms of water rental fees for, for the reservoirs? So I don't have that number off the top of my head, but it would be, it should be in the annual reports of Manitoba Hydro. I know they give the province, I'm not sure if it's just on water rentals, but like hundreds of millions of dollars. So I'm assuming it's yeah. something. I just like to see some of those water rental fees going to the community. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, just, it just irritates me that they would, you know, because it's the same. Government, right? Mm -hmm. and the Corporation of the national government. Yeah. So they're paying themselves for water. Exactly. And there's really no excuse that they can give why they have to. Other than that, you know, we want to keep the money for us. <laughs> yeah. But now there are studies being done that they give off a lot of money. Mm -hmm. You know, scientists that are doing more risk. Yeah. Yeah. And that and that's the problem with not having, you know, that consultation, that assessment being done when they were first built is and now they're just gonna keep operating, even though they contribute so much power and have resulted in deforestation and loss of use. In the picture, you know, they you fill up yeah. just as much every year. They they pay people to clean the shorelines. But that side of that reservoir, you will never be able to yeah. clean the whole shoreline. So every year it's the same amount of years, but they're still 55 years later. And so there are tons of buildings. Yeah. Oh, those are the trees on the area of the top side. That's the best from the ground when I'm refreshing the water. So 1,100 square kilometers? I think so. Yeah. yeah. And my dad used to try and save two, one tree each. Yeah. And then, yeah, it just doesn't stop when you're continually flooding. Question over here. Um, I actually had a couple questions. I'm wondering, uh, well, first, because I'm relatively new to the prairies, so I was wondering, can you explain how the Act of 1930, you were talking about how the only more historically than now, but how does it interact with the Navajo Modern Act? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So from my understanding, and I have less familiarity with the Navigable Waters Act, um, is that the NWA, like it can, it requires certain things to happen on waters that are used um, as routes and moving along. So it can be some rivers, it can be some lakes, um, but it doesn't, um, relate to uh, profiting off of or like exploiting that watershed. So it's kind of like a false distinction. Like at the end of the day, there's water and the government is involved with it. Yeah, I'm surprised that like the hydro projects themselves wouldn't trigger, because they're making waters that were now right? no. prior yes. to 2012, because in 2012, the Harvard government changed the definition of what a Navajo water is. Yeah, I remember that. But back when it was the like load of canoe with it mm -hmm. was the definition. Um, all that water that was dammed would have been Navajo, and that should have triggered 
Yeah, so from my understanding, the construction of those dams kind of in the late 19th century, um, it would have been the federal government doing it uh, in general. So they would, the Navigable Waters Act, if it was in force at that time, yeah, it all kind of would have been the same government probably saying, oh, yeah, we have these, exactly, they're just signing off um, their actions. Um, but that's a good question. I'm not completely certain how that works kind of together now, um, especially with those changes brought up. Oh, and sorry. The other thing I was wondering, um, so talking about the comp the duty to use salt, mm -hmm. because Canada is a signatory to the like international law, including like the International Labor Organization of 169 and like the UN Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous People. The, like, how does the three priors fit it? Because, like, the consultation you're talking about and the traditional duty to consult definitely informs people what was going to happen, but how are they interpreting the, like, three prior consent? Or... Yeah, so you're talking about the free prior informed consent, like, FPIC, as it's known. Um, yeah, so Canada adopted under um, a few years ago, like our own, we have our own UNDRIP Act. Um, UNDRIP doesn't necessarily guarantee those rights in the same way that um, the Charter guarantees rights or the Constitution Act guarantees rights. Instead, it's intended to inform how the government act, like exercises and performs its duties. So because it's so new, it hasn't fully been tested. Really, like, you know, Indigenous peoples often bring this up in court and they bring up UNDRIP and then courts just find a way to not talk about it. Because again, it's like the doctrine of discovery. If you're talking about it, if we're saying, we've adopted these laws and this is important to us and it is now an act of parliament, enforce it, it, it challenges those underlying structures that mean that you know, the crime can kind of do what it wants. So long story short, I think it, it kind of goes back to the other question about the duty to consult, where it really depends on who is at the table on behalf of the crown um, and to what extent they take their duties seriously, unfortunately. Um, there's so much written on under it, uh, but we really haven't seen its full effect yet. Um, any other questions today? Mm -hmm. I have a question. Sure. Um, what I'm thinking about, I comment that um, I was a criminal corporation mm -hmm. and I don't have this corporation. So, um, therefore, it should be another model when you say that you say crown, that ultimately, the um, person to the bad or the provincial ultimately, it's a provincial But I think crown is a So, how does that happen? So, that comes to the Right. So um, the crown is the state. It's not only the federal government. It's also when the government is acting. It's really the crown is what gives uh, both the province and the federal government authority to do what they do. So when we say crown, um, sometimes it's you know delineated between federal crown and provincial crown. But that distinction is kind of a distinction without much of a meaning um, for the most part. So there's the crown authority that then was delegated to the province. So the authority remains the same. It just allows the province to uh, conduct certain affairs in certain ways. And then that authority is then delegated by the province to the Crown Corporation as an agent of the Crown. So other agents of the Crown include the individuals who are negotiating treaties on behalf of the Crown. They are an agent, they have all of the um, authority and, uh, the, and responsibility and duties associated with the Crown. Uh, it's, it's one of those like, bizarre legal principles that when you really drill into it, it doesn't totally make a lot of sense. Like we'll hear federal crown think, okay, that's something totally different from the provincial crown, but fundamentally on, on a legal level, um, 
other than like what jurisdiction they operate in, there isn't really much of a like, fundamental difference, is my understanding of it. So, for example, like the Constitution Act breaks down what the provinces have control over, what the feds have control over, um, but it's still within that kind of umbrella of the crown in general, just divides it a little bit. Right. Because, like, the treaty would be basically right under the federal crown, mm -hmm. but yeah, I grew up like. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, that's yeah, yeah, and I mean, so there's also like only certain things that the federal government can do that the provincial government can't. So you can think of like the federal crown as the top, and then there's been certain things that have been delegated to the province that they can do. Oh. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, but treaty making, that's federal. Because they're kind of at the top of that pyramid for that shape. That's part of what happened with like, the drinking water standard, which we talked about earlier. Part of the issue is the providing drinking water is a provincial jurisdiction, ensuring the standards that's provincial jurisdiction. But the province has no jurisdiction over indigenous communities because they are the federal jurisdiction. So the federal government doesn't have an education department or a health department or a water department the way the province does because they don't have jurisdiction over those things for the rest of the Canadians. So therefore they don't have standards. So when the water in Winnipeg goes back, the province really kind of has to step in and make sure that the people of Winnipeg have a certain standard of water. But when the water in the group goes back, there's no being something. The federal government, the 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 class action against the federal government, and what did the federal government do? They're sending, I think, what is it, forty pallets of water, mm -hmm. yeah, of bottled water, to them. But now they have uh, continued to fight for water. Now they're they're going to be building a fourteen kilometer. After that, last hand, like, too. But, you know, what happened to the bottles? They have no recycled program. Well, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, well, we're, I mean, indigenous people are separate and less on the system in Canada. Yeah. So, education, health, water. For my son is a crown attorney, so we mm -hmm. were getting for the government, the federal government. Uh, so there's provincial crown attorneys and federal crown attorneys. So it depends kind of like what jurisdiction they operate under. Um, so do you know which one? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's the thing. The crown, like, uh, there's things that the federal crowns do and then the provincial crowns do. Crown on another day. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you on that. Maybe just get rid of the crown and draw. Justice action. If you just reflect on all your learnings and experiences, what would you suggest to Kairos as a campaign? One being colonization and the other being uh, the rights of nature. Um, Colonization is such an enormous yeah. thing to speak on. And Kairos would have done uh, work on doctrine discovery to, and also on um, treat the reconciliation calls for action. Um, but we, we're just, we're not getting down into the nitty gritty of the other federal provincial governments that operate in a colonial fashion. Mm -hmm. and, when we go to speak, say, to elected, elected uh, representatives, they're operating from that mindset. And uh, so how do we kind of get at that in a not a complicated way? If you have any ideas. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think for the rights of nature, um, raising awareness about um, these ideas is really kind of like the beginning that we need to be convincing people that this is uh, a good, easy, and effective thing that we can do. 
Um, because even if we go to court at the end of the day, if you're saying, yes, we should have uh, legal rights for like Winnipeg, the judge still has to buy that. So if we can do some work in, the, in advance of that by convincing and bringing in community members across Manitoba to start thinking about that, you know, maybe the judge in their free time will have had read a little bit about it or be a bit more familiar about it and maybe more open to that idea. Of course, the law is not quite that subjective, but, you know, there's a certain amount of interpretation that goes into it. So I would say consciousness raising on, on uh, legal rights. I would also um, really suggest, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm not as familiar with the organization, so I don't know how it connected with different First Nations communities you are, um, but I would, I kind of, I always err on the side of um, better to ask and, and, and connect with those communities with the, with what kind of help and, um, what kind of advocacy work that they need done rather than saying, okay, we're going to work on this or we're going to work on that. I think both can be effective, but I think they're more effective when different groups who are really pushing for and wanting the same things bring their voices together. Um, I don't necessarily have one um, strategy that I can suggest, but I think, you know, reaching out to some of the um, uh, First Nations organizations here in Winnipeg um, uh, as a start, or the areas that um, your group uh, extends to, so I heard Brandon and, and over to Thunder Bay as well, um, and building that relationship and those connections, and then maybe doing some kind of joint campaign could be really effective. Um, but I, I don't necessarily have like one answer for how to solve colonialism, unfortunately, I think if I did, um, We'd be in a better place, but yeah. Does that answer your question? Are you looking yes. for like kind of one particular? Like having worked uh, on justice issues, colonization is such a evil mm -hmm. framework. Yeah, and it, it not only robs uh, First Nations people, and it also and Native people, it also robs uh, settler people, and. Uh, However, separate people are privileged often. They have money, they have position, and they have all the relation to carry on. Yeah, so it has a nice bubble. Yeah, it? it's very nice mm -hmm. bubble. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so it's that bubble that I'm just sort of wondering about. And I know we have mm -hmm. spoken at all around mm -hmm. various levels. For example, if Congress went in and made a presentation to the judges, is that a possibility? Are they taking education? Uh, they do through the National Judicial Institute, so it might be worthwhile reaching out to them. I don't know um, what kind of like external uh, presentations they get, but you know that's definitely something that would be worthwhile to pursue. Um, on colonization in general, I think like for me, what I find really effective is raising these topics that challenge the fundamentals of how we got here. You know, challenging, like you said, the doctrine of discovery or terminologists, um, the ideas that support our current systems um, and raising awareness about those. Um, it's difficult when you have are in a position, let's say like in the provincial government, where you have also like, legal obligations to uphold like you have duties to the crown so it's tricky um i you know i i don't really have a good answer for you unfortunately yeah. thank you for the reproduction it's helpful um i was just wondering and so when we're talking about crown corporations and stuff, the Royal Canadian Mount Police is also like supposed to be upholding the Constitution. Um, but then the court, when it comes to injunctions, are often granting injunctions to corporations, mm -hmm. um, which are not visible to Canada, mm -hmm. uh, in order to put in like major hydro or pipelines mm -hmm. and then indigenous people who should be protected under section 105 and by GDR. 
like arrested because of it. so can you speak at all to like why it's important or what have been the interpretations around like granting these injunctions and how is the RCMP justifying protecting corporations in this uh, so first and foremost, the RCMP was founded as um, a way for the crown to assert its control over uh, indigenous peoples. They also, while they have those duties to uphold the constitution, uh, fundamentally they're meant to be that arm of the crown. They don't uh work for all like they don't work for indigenous peoples in the way that um you know perhaps we would like them to um and they are also formed to protect economic interests so when we have that in mind um it makes a little bit more sense why they're protecting uh corporate uh interests rather than indigenous interests um there's a really interesting paper on uh, injunctions by the Yellowhead Institute. So if you're interested in that, it's really easy to read. It's like a couple pages. The Yellowhead Institute is out of the Toronto Met University, um, and it's run exclusively by um, Indigenous academics. And they did a breakdown on injunctions and around natural resources. Uh, and when First Nations people are involved, and when a First Nation, pardon me, when an Indigenous organization, Indigenous peoples assert their rights and try to bring an injunction, they're successful about 20% of the time. When a corporation does, they're successful about 80% of the time. So there's also a real bias in the law itself around injunctions, because one of the things that the court will consider is precedent, but also what the economic impact will be. So that's part of that legal test. So if they're saying, well, you know, the government gave this corporation a license to do what they're doing, uh, and it's going to impact their ability to exercise that license, then the injunction leads in favor, means in favor of the corporation. So unless there's like explicit wrongdoing or the corporation is doing something outside of their license, it's really difficult to be effective um, receiving injunctive relief. So long story short, this is what happens when we have a colonial um, court system and uh, uh, the RCMP being really a colonial force to, you know, uphold those structures. What are you shocked by the whole West American situation? That is the equivalent of, um, you know, us deciding we're going to put a pipeline in part of the United States territory, and we got our mountains <laughs> to keep the Americans from stopping us doing it. I mean, it's just like, I, I, I mean, they should be protecting the Indigenous people's sovereign territory as opposed to letting, and, and they did actually give them alternate routes that they could use, mm -hmm. you know, and with consul uh, consultation, you also have to have, you can't just say, oh, this is what we want to do. You have to bring, like, at least, how many, is it three or four or five or something alternate plans? Mm -hmm. It's not just one, otherwise it's not a valid consultation. And and then they usually don't even bother with consent. Like even with the hydro work that they were doing, um, that they had consultations with at uh, the convention center a few years ago, they had all this, these brochures and all these indigenous languages. But you know, this one uh, person I know who works for hydro is like, yeah, it's no. Yeah, it's a rubber stamp, right? I over here we had that question about well, um, you know, I was talking about the Clean Environment Commission and then the national regulator. Like those boards and tribunals can do good work, but often they're pretty beholden to those corporate interests. Um, no, like the National Energy Board is appointed by the federal government, yep. usually the people who were in the past. Yep. Or 
Yeah. Yeah. And it's the same with the CEC here in, in Manitoba. Yeah. I guess I want to be close. So we have like seven different issues. Yeah. 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 Former executives from finally gas companies deciding where you do off. Yeah. Yeah. Not a great system. Yes. I just sorry. No, I'm just okay. wondering if there's any questions from our people on the on the what are, on Zoom online. Yeah, I'll take uh, some questions from okay. folks on the uh, online if there's any. Barry, can you? I don't see can any. We 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 can hear you asking for questions, and I don't okay. know that we have any yeah, unless we're going to speak up. Okay. Sorry for that. Okay. Right now I'm on, so that's all right. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Right. Well, Natalie, I want to thank you very much. You oh, opened up a whole other discussion on this uh, topic of sacred water, and I really appreciate it, and we all appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you for having we have a presentation with Shannon from Kairos, Canada. And Shannon, I don't, uh, we also have Allison Cox in our gathering here. And um, she would like to talk about 10 minutes about her trip to Kairos COP 27. And I didn't know if you have that included in your presentation or how you'd like to handle that. Well, I actually have a, a picture of Allison in my presentation, but I would rather have her speak live. So she's there in the room. Yes. Um, Allison, would you like to go first or do you want to be the conclusion? Want to go later? Okay. Okay. Sounds good. So you can uh, invite Allison to join us after you're done, Janet. Excellent. Great. Good. I'm going to spotlight you. Okay. All right. Well, folks, I have done quite a number of Zoom presentations, but not one where there were only a few online and I can't see the mo most of you in the room. Uh -huh. Oh, good. <laughs> it's nice to see you there. Um, so I wanted to say a little bit about uh, Kairos campaigns that are going on and I'm going to start uh, a presentation. So hold on a second while I share my screen. There, Carrie, are you folks seeing the um, the full presentation? Not yet. It says she started streaming sharing, but hasn't come on yet. Hopefully, we'll have it. There it is. Okay. All right. Hopefully, I can maneuver my notes and the slides too. So the. The theme for Climate Action Month, which has been happening every September um, and for the last uh, three or four years, this year is Decolonize Climate Action, and that theme will extend throughout the year. Of course, it is a theme that needs to be looked at all the time, but so do many issues, and so we will be focusing on decolonizing climate action um, throughout this year. So I have a question for you. Since we started this campaign at the beginning of September already, um, and I'm going to look uh, at the few that are online and try to gauge the room. Do we have some hands up if uh, you have already written to your member of parliament about ending sacrifice zones? We had a couple of letter writing sessions on the uh, 8th of September. Paul was raising his hand there. And I can't see, see, you're too small on my screen to see if anyone else did in the room. Um, 
that's great that we have a few and I look forward to encouraging the rest of you to do the same. So let me go into a little bit more detail. To start out with, I have a question for you, a question that has been asked of me. How do you imagine an environmentalist or a climate activist? Just literally get a picture in your mind. So I want to um, give you some per uh, perspectives from my colleague, Radia Bangu. And she wrote an article, a great article, called De Decolonization is at the Heart of Effective Climate Action. And she's basically starting with this question that have been highlighted elsewhere. How do you imagine an, an environmentalist or a climate activist? And then depending on um, sort of your situation in life, and um, how you find yourself, myself as a settler, as um, a white, cisgendered, queer um, person in a major urban city uh, with uh, education, those are all things that impact how we um, move in the world and how we think of ourselves. In particular, when we're talking about decolonization, we're talking about racism. And we're, um, and so I, I ask you also to think about, do you or I speak on behalf of impacted communities? Do we make space for diversity and a decolonial lens through our work? Do we have unequal power structures that highlight one voice to the detriment of non-white climate activists? Here I sit using my voice. It's a very valid question. And how do I and you profit from resource extraction and climate change? I will be sending around all the links that I referenced to. Um, you can have a copy of this slide presentation. So um, there are just a few people probably getting them online, but you will get them later. So do check out Radia's article where she makes a few important points in her voice here. Let's face it, the environmental movement has always centered white voices. When you think of a cl climate activist, who do you envision? And would it surprise you that millions of people engaged in greenhouse gas mitigation and adaptation live in African nations and that many of them are women? Radia is the Kairos Africa Partnerships Coordinator. And she points out that environmental racism persists everywhere because it has deep, very deep roots that stretch back to slavery. A white supremacist narrative supports it and patriarchy enables it. It is perpetuated by resource extraction, including by Canadian companies and policies as we've already heard today. Colonization is an extractive relationship with exploitation at its center. So what then is decolonization? Decolonizing climate action begins with recognition that colonialism is still active in our world. And colonialism is when one country exerts full or partial control over another country. So a couple of examples, military, political, bureaucratic, economic, and ruling ideas. So we've been talking today mostly about um, closer to home, provincial jurisdiction, and some federal. It's also an issue among nations in the, on the international stage.
forms of colonization that occurred during the age of European imper imperial expansion have profoundly shaped the world to this day. Many forms of injustice and inequality are associated with European colonization and have often been based, uh, sorry, have often been adapted by other countries. Colonization has shaped the ways that climate policy is negotiated and implemented because it has shaped the power relationships between nations and peoples. So to decolonize climate policy means to recognize the ongoing effects of colonialism on international and Canadian climate policy and to take action to change and reverse these effects. Decolonization is about much more than just wider inclusion. So that's a little bit and just a little bit more on environmental racism before we go into what we can do. Environmental racism refers to environmental harms that are disproportionately distributed along racial lines. I'm sure you can imagine many different situations where this is the case, just as we have heard already today. One quote from the Smart Prosperity Institute, Black and other racialized communities are disproportionately vulnerable to environmental pollution and climate change due to socioeconomic and political structures that decrease their capacity to build resilience against environmental hazards and to participate in decision-making that affect the exposure levels to pollutants of their communities. So environmental racism is in Canada, it's across the globe, and it's directly harming Indigenous communities and all racialized communities. There is a bill before the Canadian Parliament that is an act respecting the development of a national strategy to assess, prevent, and address environmental racism. This is a bill that we want to support. It was uh, tabled for the third time. This is the third time that someone has put forward a private member's bill um, on the issue of environmental racism. And this bill was tabled by Elizabeth May, the MP for Saanich Gulf Islands, and it has passed second reading already. So, and in addition to that, the Minister of Environment and Climate Change stated in the House of Commons that the government supports this bill. So we are hopeful that this bill will become law, but it, as is the case with every bill, a little bit of support goes a long way. And so we're inviting you to write letters in support of this bill. There are two other bills in the House that we are less certain will um, become law and that really need our advocacy at this point. And so we suggest that you talk to your MPs about all three of the bills together because they are a package that would really uh, serve to address environmental racism um, in strong ways. The others talk about corporate accountability. Um, global partners, you know, have repeatedly reported on the harms caused by extractive companies and called on all of us, Kairos included, to take action. In particular, women environmental human rights defenders, those that are on the forefront of land and water protection are routinely harassed, targeted, attacked even murdered for their efforts. So we want effective Canadian federal laws and one that is in the House at this point is Bill C-262, an act respecting the corporate responsibility to prevent, address, and 
remedy adverse impacts on human rights occurring in relation to business activities conducted abroad. If you've been around Kairos for a while, you may think that this sounds familiar. It should be. We have been campaigning for decades for this sort of thing. And we. Um, this is talked about as um, mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence legislation. This is an effort to get Canadian companies operating abroad to clean up their act. And for the Canadian government to see that they do that. This uh, bill has been supported by many organizations, by church leaders, by global partners, and you can read about it on the Kairos website. We are less certain that it has much support from MPs, and we urge you to talk to your MP about the importance of this. This is what will help us break environmental racism um, that Canadians are responsible for in the global scene. A second bill that accompanies it is Bill C-263, an act to establish the Office of the Commissioner for Responsible Business Conduct Abroad and to make consequential amendments to other acts. So this is the one that we talk about as giving the core, which is the Commissioner for Responsible um, business conduct. I've got those letters in the wrong order there, but um, giving this position some teeth. There was much fanfare um, a number of years ago about when the Canadian Ombudsperson for Responsible Enterprise was introduced. And so there is an existing position that is responsible for the actions of Canadian corporations. However, those corporations are not obliged to cooperate. Um, it is their choice whether they um, abide by any recommendations that the ombudsperson might make. Um, and so there really is very little power in that office. And um, Bill C-263 aims to change that. So this is our call. These three bills that I have mentioned, Bill, uh, first one is Bill 226 on ending environmental racism in Canada. And then Bill 262 and 263, which are sort of partner bills around corporate accountability. And we have uh, put together some information that talks about all three of these so that you can share with your members of parliament um, how important each of them is in ending racial um, environmental sacrifice zones. So there is an option, and we will send you this link to just click on a link, fill in your name and address, and send off a letter. And it is valuable to do that. And we would ask you to pass it around and see if you can get everyone in your congregation, everyone in your local group and whatever communities and networks you have to do that. But I would also invite you to write your own letter or call your MP or even better make an appointment to visit your MP and really explain the importance of these bills um, to decolonize climate action. I want to share a few other announcements with you. So that um, ending sacrifice zones is the core of our fall campaign. But we are also building to uh, support a delegation of people who are heading to, um, to COP27 in Egypt this November. And so 
Um, I wanted to, Ali will maybe tell you about a little bit more about it from her perspective, but um, Kairos and For the Love of Creation together are supporting this delegation, which will be in uh, Sharm el Sheikh for about uh, 10 days, um, raising the voices of Indigenous voices, women's voices, African voices, youth voices. Um, all of those people are represented in this delegation. We're very excited to see them go. We met many of them, excuse me, on um, in the middle of September through some interviews. And we will be able to meet with them live. I think I have a slide about that. So just hang on a second. But we are also doing a number of things to build the awareness and to build the momentum of this delegation going to Egypt. And so I'd invite you to join in and support and circulate and publicize any of these initiatives that I'm going to talk about now. So the first one is the 2022 Kairos Youth Poster Contest. We did a poster contest last year. The first one was on our 20th anniversary of Kairos, and we've decided to make it an annual event. So if you know any artists, if you know any teachers or others that have um, uh, direct relationships with uh, students or young adults, please talk to them, encourage folks to um, to enter their art in this art contest. Um, what The sunflower that you see on the side there was the Kairos Choice winner from last year by a grade, I think a grade 11 student, Adri Gronsteg in um, St. Michael's Catholic Secondary School. And she titles her work, Love What We Have Before It's Too Late. Something else that is a month away, but you will um, want to start thinking about it now, is an invitation to uh, hold vigils for climate justice. Candles for COP27 is an invitation that um, goes out to groups all across Canada, and we invite you, so I really hope there'll be some in Manitoba and Northwestern Ontario, to gather with whatever size of group you might have in a public space, hopefully. Perhaps you would let the media know that you'll be there, but really the most important part is to gather with whoever wants to, to um, join hearts and minds um, and send good energy to COP27. Think about our delegates who are going to be there. Some of these, Vigils may be religious spaces, faith spaces, where we will offer our prayers. Hopefully many of them will be that way. Others may sit in reflection in, in other ways. And we are working on getting a map of uh, Canada up where you can note your vigil. And so um, I will send you a link with all the details and just start thinking about it in your group. It doesn't need to be huge. Where there are half a dozen people um, gathered in a park or on a street corner or in front of an MP's office or wherever you think is important to talk about climate justice and to reflect uh, um, is an important point. The date is chosen because it's halfway through COP. COP is a two week session and this is the middle weekend. Another opportunity is for individuals to join the animators circle. This group of people will be supporting the delegates and supporting our communities in learning more about these United Nations climate conferences that I have been shorthanding with COP27. I hope you folks are all well versed in that language. So this animator circle will be a group of people who are committed to animating and uplifting communications 
from the delegates and from other COP27 information. So people who are comfortable with, with writing, with posting, with using social media, not everyone needs to be comfortable with social media. We need some writers and we need some people to be watching what's going on and offering information and, and uh, pieces that we can share. The first meeting of this group will be on the October 26th and you're all invited. And there will be a chance to talk with the delegates. Uh, November 3rd. Now this is a global delegation and so the time that worked best for all of the delegates in eight different time zones was 8 30 in the morning November 3rd. Um, this will be uh, translated in three languages. We hope that some of you will be ready to get up in 7 30 Manitoba time but if you're not uh, there will also be some later recap as well as a, a recording of that live session. And uh, thank you to the gathering, to you, Alan, and everyone who was involved in the planning for taking this time. And uh, you know, encourage you to take a look and open up that email when you get that big list of links. There's all kinds of things, ways you can get involved. Thanks, everyone. And I look forward to seeing you next time, hopefully in person. Thank you, Shannon. Really appreciate your contribution. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to ask uh, Elder uh, Ellen uh, Cook to come and close our gathering today. I don't know if I gave you one of these. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I have a real one at home. I know you do. <laughs> <laughs> don't you like my answers? <laughs> okay, if we can stand, then I am here. I am here, Thomas. I am here means to talk. I am here means to talk to God. Um, there's a new thing, I can't even remember what it is that they're saying now, instead of saying Ayamiyata, it's a different word that they're using, and I asked my cousin, why are they saying that? Why are they not, why are they, why are they not using that word Ayamiyata? He said, because that means that you're talking to God. I said, well, doesn't, uh, it's not what you do when you pray, and uh, that logic me. He said, we talked to the creator. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense. Anyway, I am Let's talk later. Say, ask the time was to get his cigar with the Yagi Mamma. If we need to know of a to our community, we want to drop a midwife. Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for this day. We thank you that we were able to see each other again because we didn't see each other for a long time in person. Okay, we ask that you be with us on our way home when we go back to our families and see the ones we love. I thank you, Creator, for, for life. I thank you, Creator, for life. Askiosti for, for the earth, for our mother Kigawino, for fires, but still, we thank you for air. Because they can all hurt and they can also, we can also not live without them. But we ask that you find a way to start eating our mother who is suffering from all this exploitation and abuse. Honey, you say, Matu, and then ask me, hey, you start on a beast of God, and I say, yeah, this year. Thank you, Creator, for this day. We have finished our work. We also ask you that you be with Allison and her delegation that are going to Egypt. Keep them safe and return them home safely back to us. We ask that you be with them and that you uh, you share with them the wonderful 
times over there that they will meet people, meet family over there that, that uh, they can connect with. Agoni, you say one thing. That's it. Dear God. Agoni. Amen.